It is Tuesday night in East Lansing, Michigan. Come on in, gather around, gather around, gather around, gather around. Happy to see everybody. Great to have you here on a Tuesday night, a March night in the year of 2023, getting toward tournament time. It is tournament time. I want to wish each and every one of you a very happy and merry tournament time, tournament week, conference tournament week. Next week, big dance tournament week. I hope you have all your tournament shopping done. Clocks, clocks ticking down. Sunday is Selection Sunday. In the meantime, i got a big tournament going on down there in Chicago. It's going to be a lot of fun. Paul Kornadike is going to be down there covering for SpartanMag.com. I'll be back here in the home front keeping an eye on things, keeping an eye on all, all you rascals over the Underground Bunker message board and the Final Four message board at SpartanMag.com. And on Selection Sunday, you know, last year and the year before, we had a Spartan Mag Live after the brackets came out, maybe about two hours after the brackets came out. Maybe we will do that again. We'll have to wait and see what's going on. Is Michigan State playing on Sunday? That'll, that'll have an impact on that as well. Anyway, my name is Jim Comproni, publisher of SpartanMag.com. I've been the publisher of SpartanMag.com since the beginning of the darn internet. And I'm not tired yet. I'm having a good time. I appreciate all the subscribers out there that have made it possible for uh, SpartanMag.com to become... Uh, a place that you like to go to for credible Michigan State sports coverage, analysis, feature stories, game stories, uh, coverage of practice, all that stuff. And, of course, the Underground Bunker message board, which is, which is the church of what's happening now with Michigan State sports. It is the daily narrative on Michigan State sports. It has been that way since the beginning of the Internet back in the 90s. And we got a big basketball season coming to an end right now. Not coming to an end, but the regular season's coming to an end. And Michigan State's starting to rev up. I told you last week I like this team. Some of you didn't. A lot of you did. Izzo's been saying it for a few weeks, for those that would listen. Got a lot of work to do, though, still. I was at practice today, and I'm sitting there watching, and I'm wondering, man, how many teams in the country are getting, at, getting after it as good as Michigan State is right now? I mean, Izzo was... He was rip-snorting up and down the court, holding people accountable, but also pats on the back when applicable. I mean, it was... I mean, their practices always have great attention to detail and urgency, but ticking up a little bit, ticking up even more. And it was a good practice, a morning practice, because it's spring break right now at Michigan State. They don't have classes, so they're able to practice in the morning. And he said on Monday that they may even go twice on Tuesday, today being Tuesday. I didn't verify whether or not they were going to have two practices today. Uh, he said they're going to they're gonna go at it like they're going to get some rest later. Um, it's a good long break for Michigan State when you consider that Michigan State defeated Ohio State on Senior Day Saturday at Breslin Center at noon. And then the rest of the Big Ten played on Sunday. Had noon at home. So by 3 o'clock, they're in recovery mode. All the rest of the afternoon, into the evening, into the night, recovering. And then Sunday, I don't know if they took Sunday off or not. They had a meeting. At least, I mean, they always meet. But Sunday, when everybody else is playing, including like Indiana and Michigan playing 6 o'clock till 8, Michigan is in, a, is in the air at 9 o'clock on a Sunday night. Michigan State is already 30 hours having finished their game. So then when Monday came and it was time to practice again, Michigan State was fresh and ready to go. They won a couple of games. They've been shooting really well. They've got a lot to work on in terms of defense. So Monday, they had a spirited practice. Today, spirited practice. Um, of course, finishing in the top four, they got a double bye, so they don't have to play till Friday. That's another reason they can go after it harder today and practice on Tuesday. If they had been scheduled to play on Sunday night and then they didn't get the double bye and they only had Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday to get ready to play on Thursday, then their practice week this week would be completely different. So the schedule's been difficult for Michigan State all along. It seems like it's difficult for Michigan State most years. But in this case, we'll have to wait and see whether it pays dividends or not. But I can see that Izzo felt that they could really mini-camp it a little bit here at the beginning of the week because they played on Saturday at home at noon. That gave them some extra time, and then they get double double by till Friday. Gave them extra time. We'll see um, what they look like. In Chicago, they'll come out, you know, maybe they'll play, as you guys know, it's either Iowa or Wisconsin or Ohio State. Um, oh, Iowa would be an interesting one after that double overtime, or that not the double overtime, the overtime loss in Iowa City a couple weeks ago. Uh, you guys know what happened there. It was a very legendary, memorable game, aggravating game for Michigan State, of course. Would Michigan State like another crack at them? I mean, they, they, they split with Iowa. I don't think there's any, like, animosity in terms of 
revenge or anything like that. But they'd, they'd probably like to get get another shot at that one. But you know, Iowa won the Big Ten tournament last year. They will have played a game already if they played the Hawkeyes on Friday. That's an advantage to Iowa. So um, get past that, then you're in the semifinals. And we'll talk a little bit about that. I think we're going to have Coden Dyke on tonight talking a little basketball again. Maybe even Nils Deco, formerly of the Horn in Austin, Texas. I think he might be calling in. We, we might be able to get a hold of him as well. Or I might have to call them. Like last time, we had a little problem with uh, the phone. I had to call them. But anyway, I'm going to send uh, – what we're going to do is we're going to go straight to the – to the mailbag. What we do is we invite our SpartanMag.com subscribers over at SpartanMag.com to post on Underground Bunker Message Board any questions they have, and we will field those questions here mailbag style on Spartan Mag Live. That's how we did it, how we do it. Have a good time with it. We appreciate those that come by and watch. We're creeping up to almost to 7,000 subscribers. We appreciate that. Go ahead and subscribe to this channel. We'd love to have you as a subscriber. Go over to SpartanMag.com if you're not already a subscriber. We would love to, for you to consider becoming a SpartanMag.com subscriber. If you like this nonsense, if you like talking about Michigan State sports any day of the week, any week of the month, any month of the year, then you're probably a sick enough individual to really like SpartanMag.com too. So I suggest you try it. You'll like it. and you'll, You might not thank me for it, but you'll thank someone for it. You might thank Conan Dyke. You might thank Noah Sprunger. You might thank Jason Killup. You might thank Matt Dorsey. Representing the old guard. But you'll think somebody because you'll like it. I know you will. Pretty confident in that. But anyway, uh, question number one. Let's go to the mailbag right now. A lot of news today, by the way. Um, Nick Marsh, four-star wide receiver. River Rouge High School, 6'3", 200. Been committed to Michigan State since last July. Michigan State's been recruiting hard since ninth grade. Committed to Michigan State. Lynchpin recruit for the 2024 class today, decommitted from Michigan State, announced it on social media. Surprise. Ranked number 56 player in the nation by On3 and the On3 industry rankings. Number 10 wide receiver in the country, 6'3", 200, smooth athlete, gifted, all the things. Um, good kid, smart kid. You know, really a mature young man. It hurts Michigan State. We'll talk about that a little bit. On three, by the way, has a number 123 in the country, but the industry composite. It's not called the composite. It's called the, uh, they created the composite, and then they, they got the consensus. They changed from consensus to the industry rankings at on3.com. Uh, on three has a number 123 in the nation. The industry rankings has a number 56 in the nation. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, Tyson Walker, second team, all Big Ten named today. Honorable mention for Michigan State, Joey Hauser and A.J. Hogard. I think I, I wrote, out of the 14 teams in the Big Ten, something like 10 or 11 teams put players among the 16 that made first team, second team, or third team. And yeah, I think there was 16. I think second team had like six. I didn't take that long a look at it, but I did add up which schools there were. Michigan had three. Uh, Kobe Bufkin, the big man, and then um, Jet Howard. Uh, but then they, you know, they didn't end up. They were second place when most people voted, but they ended up cycling down to whatever they were, 7th, 8th, ninth. Michigan's still pretty good. I thought Michigan looked good against Illinois and Indiana, even though they lost those games. They got to beat Rutgers, which they think they will. Then they need to beat Purdue to get in, which I think they could. Um, I think Michigan is pretty good in spurts. They were terrible on sideline inbound plays, though. Terrible coming off the bench, trying to execute whatever was going on whatever Juwan Howard was trying to draw up on the sideline. They were terrible in executing it. One time, I don't want to get too much into that. But anyway, I, you know, you know, I come out of those Michigan games against Illinois and Indiana. I'm like, if those games are on neutral courts, I think Michigan wins both of those games. I come out of those games thinking Michigan's a better team. That's where college basketball is strange. People really flip it out about Michigan State and the way they lost that game to Iowa. Yeah, it was heartbreaking in Michigan State. You know, lost lost some defensive focus and let them come back. And they hit five three-pointers in the last 39 seconds. Michigan State, should they foul? Should they defend? That's been debated for more than a week. But I come out of that game thinking, man, Michigan State was good enough to be up 13 on a good Iowa team on the road with two minutes to go. I know Iowa came back and won the game. That's fine. I'm just talking about how the – and that, you know, the, it's not like Michigan State was playing for a Big Ten championship. Playing for seedings, yes. But the win, the loss, whatever, you know – I think that stuff can get overrated in early March once the standings are done. I'm looking for who's going to be strong in the NCAA tournament. I come out of that game thinking Michigan State's got a better chance to be strong in the NCAA tournament than Iowa did, even though Iowa won the game. Does that make any sense? It does to me. 
I thought Michigan looked pretty good against Illinois and Indiana. Didn't close it out. And uh, I know a lot of you would like to see Michigan held out of that NCAA tournament. That'd be kind of funny, considering the things Dickinson said and has said over the year and the season and all that stuff. Anyway, uh, Tyson Walker, second team all Big Ten. Joey Hauser and uh, A.J. Hogard, honorable mention. If the vote were today and people took another look at Joey Hauser's statistics, or maybe the fact that A.J. Hogard is, is like 28, what, 21, 21 assists and only two turnovers in the last two games. They've really finished strong. They may have gotten more votes, maybe been third team. I don't know. I don't even know if I can vote on that. I, I used to vote on that. I, I might have voted once, like back in 1995. I don't have time to vote. I just would rather the votes come in and then I criticize them. That's kind of what I like to do. Anyway, uh, Joey Hauser, the big news today, announced that he is, he says, never say never, but no, he's not expecting to come back next year, which I'm really not sure how he could even apply I've been asking Michigan State officials, I'm like, how does he have a chance to apply or petition to the NCAA? Is it because he wanted that year back when they made him sit out? He's like the last college athlete to ever have to sit out due to transfer, I think, ever. Him and Jaden Reed, ironically, Michigan State, happening to them. Didn't happen to Shea Patterson, though. It's another story, almost a different decade. So I don't know if he could have gone back and gotten that one or the medical red shirt he had at, at Marquette back in six years ago. But I don't understand. Because this year he was, he was a sixth-year senior. I don't know how he could have gotten a seventh. Because he sat out the one year, but the year he had to sit out as a transfer turned out to be the COVID year, which didn't count against anybody's eligibility. So I'm not sure how or why or what. It doesn't matter now because he says he's not coming back. No surprise there. Um with him not coming back, I still think there's a good chance Malik Hall comes back. I think there's a pretty good chance Tyson Walker comes back. They, they'll have to look to see what's available to them and what's going on name, image, and likeness-wise there at Michigan State. Malik Hall, it'd be interesting if he comes back and has a whole year with no injuries and he's not splitting time with Joey Hauser. He gets along really well with Joey Hauser, the good teammates and all of that. But if Hauser moves on, would Hall then blossom? Different positions, different decade, different situation. But think about Scott Skiles in 86 after Sam Vincent moved on. Two great players, two NBA players. They did really well in 85. That team probably underachieved. But in 86, after Vincent moved on, Skiles really able to blossom. I'm not saying that Malik Hall is going to become an all-time great, but I think he could be good. Konadak and I talked about this in the VCast after the Ohio State game. That was Xavier Booker coming in. It would help Booker if Malik Hall is around uh, to just, you know, just bring him in under his wing and show him the ropes and all those things. I would anticipate Malik Hall being, he's been a wing forward all this year. I wonder next year if he goes to the four a little bit more because they'll they'll have a little more, if, if Walker comes back and Aikens, then Hall goes to the four next year. I think it could happen. Anyway, uh, they, they're not even talking about that yet. Mailbag time. Let's go question number one from... No, actually, we'll save that question. Question number one, Jake from Traverse City, Michigan. He says, well, since the news just broke, what are your thoughts on Nick Marsh decommitting? Also, question 1A from Mile High in Golden, Colorado, asks any insight on Nick Marsh's decommitment. Interested in your thoughts and implications. I talked a little bit about, a little bit about this at the beginning of the show, if you're just uh, tuning in. Um no way that this is good news for Michigan State. Was it a surprise internally? I've not heard yet. I suspect it might have been. You know, he's a linchpin, cornerstone, in-state, four-state, four-star guy that was a big-time recruit from the time he showed out against DeWitt, I think it was, as a uh, freshman in the state championship. Michigan State offered him soon thereafter. And, uh, oh. hey, it looks like we got... We've got it's Don Strait. Don Strait with a donation of the personal tip jar. He's a personal sponsor tonight. We appreciate Don uh, very much with his support of Spartan Mag Live over the years at SpartanMag.com and all the things in the Spartan Mag News organization. Thanks a lot, Don. Really appreciate your help. Appreciate your support. $35, man. Really appreciate that in the super chat. Thanks, Don. Really do appreciate it. You be good. Maybe I'll see you around soon. Thank you. He says, uh, Don, back on the board for the first time in a while, sipping the go-to bottle, Evan Williams, white label. My question is in the queue, Pope. Let it roll. Nobody does it better. Thanks, Don. Yeah, I do have your question. We'll get to that later. 
I'm not an expert when it comes to different alcoholic beverages and categories and so forth. So I'm not sure what Evan Williams is. So someone's going to have to tell me what that is over there in the comment section. And y'all feel free to go ahead and comment in the comment section, and I will get to those questions as we go. So Nick Marsh and the decommitment. Um, you know, Michigan State with a difficult season this year, 5-7, and seven, everybody knows that, but Michigan State got off to a really good start with commitments from three four-star recruits. And Nick Marsh was one of them, in-state guy. Michigan State's recruited in-state pretty good under Mel Tucker for the guys that they've gone after. They haven't gone after a, a deep cast of players in-state. You know, they haven't really gone for those two-star reach guys in state. Um, so when they've gone for players in state, they've, they've, they've gone hard. And Nick Marsh was the first guy they went after hard for in the 2024 class. They really impressed him. He loves Michigan State. Uh, committed, obviously. And he was looking like a, a big-time member of that class. Obviously. Last summer, like he committed in J- July... Jason Killip and I were in Big Rapids for the Big Rapids, you know, Fair State Camp. It's done in conjunction kind of with Sound Mind, Sound Body. And he had not he was not yet a commitment, but Michigan State was watching him closely. Courtney Hawkins was there watching him closely. Michigan coaches, the wide receivers coach, can't think of his name right now, was shoulder to shoulder with with Marsh. You know, I mean, they were really trying to get a foot in the door because everybody knew Michigan State had the lead at that point. Shortly thereafter, a couple weeks later, he commits to Michigan State. But Michigan was very much interested in him at the time. Uh, you know, still have to see which schools are in there strong. We're hearing Alabama, maybe, maybe Tennessee. Penn State has recruited to Detroit well in recent years. Uh, but a hey, tough news for Michigan State. Like Jason Gillip wrote today over at SpartanMag.com, it's, it's kind of rare for a recruit to commit to a school, then decommit, and then end up back at that school. Usually it usually it takes a lot for them to pull the trigger on the decommitment. And it's it's uh not only does Michigan State lose a commitment, but chan- you know, he still says Michigan State's gonna be high on his list, and at this time I'm sure they are. But as he opens it back up, um it's I think it's gonna be hard for Michigan State to uh, reel him back in. That's just a gut feel at this point. He is a different type of young man, though. He's very um He's uh, he's his own man, and he's intelligent, mature. So if there were the type of player that would decommit and end up back at the same school, maybe it's someone like him because he is a little different than, than others. He's interesting. He's uh, respectful and a respectable young man. I wish him the best. Uh, tough news for Michigan State today. You know, last year Michigan State had a commitment from four-star running back Kedrick Riscano um, from Texas. Committed to Michigan State for a long time, then decommitted, and then Michigan State got back involved and uh, was back in strong with that with that recruitment. And you know that one came down to a lot of it. It wasn't the deciding factor, but Michigan State was talking to him. They knew him well. They were talking, hey, name name image and likeness. That's the name of the game, right? There were a lot of talks that way. Michigan State went after him pretty strong, but uh, ended up not being able to. Reel him in, and he ended up. Uh, although he, you know, he visited Michigan State again, maybe even three times, and uh, ended up signing with Ole Miss, kid from Texas. So it happened to Michigan State last year. Now it happens again, and Michigan State's going to double back and try to go after him. But it's going to be difficult. There's no way to spin this. That's not good news for Michigan State. Um, you know, they'll get good wide receiver recruits one way or another. They're going to hope that he's one of them. But um, tough news for Michigan State recruiting wise today. Uh, Mile High from Golden, Colorado, also asks about Jesse McCulloch. McCulloch is a basketball recruit, 2024, out of Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland uh, Lutheran East High School, 6'9", 215, ranked the number 162 player in the country, number 21 center, number 5 player in Ohio. Official visit to Alabama in February. Official visit to Michigan State this past weekend. Um, Mile High wants to know what I'm hearing about that visit. We're still looking into it. Um, he visited. Uh, he was at the Michigan State Purdue game as well on January 16th, and Izzo went and watched him in an open gym on September 29th. That was that one day when Izzo went along, went around, did like 17 hours, and saw th- 13 or 14, or saw 
He was in four or five different states that, that day, maybe three or four. So Michigan State's been interested in him for a long time. Alabama's in there. Michigan's been in there in the past with him. Um, also Ohio State. So I, I, hear, I, hear, I hear that he loved the visit. His family was here. They loved it. Michigan State thinks it went well. And, you know, there's, some, there's, a, there's a chance for a decision. You know, Michigan State might be interested in trying to get a decision here in the next three or four weeks. We'll keep our ear to the ground on that one. Pretty good uh, prospect. Needs to improve his mobility. Uh, but he's a junior right now at Lutheran East in Cleveland. Question number, we're going to call it number three. I'm going to table one until a little bit later. Uh, Big Don. Don, who just gave us that personal sponsorship, he says, excellent, Jim. I've missed the last few Spartan Mag Lives. As always, fantastic coverage. Thank you to Don. Who and what have been the biggest developments in Michigan State basketball this year? And speculate how the pieces of an outstanding recruiting class will fit. That's a question I'd like to get into with Conan Dyke. I'm going to try to call him right now. Let's see if we can bring him in. Actually, uh, let's see. Sorry about that. Um, biggest developments in Michigan State basketball this year. A.J. Hogarth keeps getting better and better at uh, not looking for his own shot too much, not in intruding on the happenings. Izzo's been working and working and working with him to see the point guard role at Michigan State the way Izzo sees it. Hogard has been agreeable. Agreeable, and uh, and that's great because there was a time early in his career where I'm not sure Hogard, I'm not sure I would have thought Hogard would have go along with everything as well as he has. Hogard's pretty smart. Maybe he sees that Doing it is those ways good for the team and good for himself, Hogard, for the long haul. Hogard, um, and you know, in, in so doing, Hogard's not hunting his, his shot. He takes shots when they're available, when he's wide open, shot clock's down and inside out. He's got the freedom to shoot inside out three pointers, shot clock down or shot clock drive. He's getting, he scored 23 points the other day without really looking for his shot a whole lot. Two out of three from three point range. Also had a, you know, ball screen layup and then free throws at the end. So Hogard's coming along. Hauser, Hauser's just, just, he's just personality-wise. He's just enjoying things. He's like loose and smiling. He, he'd been so pent up for two or three years. Transfer, had to sit out. Then it was COVID. Then last year was struggle for part of the year, trying to find a shot. Now he's found a shot. And if there's a better shooter in the, in the Big Ten right now, I don't know who it is. He's shooting like 70% from three-point range in the last three games. Just absurd. Just obscene as a shooter, and that's helped this team a lot. So, Hauser is a development. Hogard's a development. Those have got to be the ones, right? And just team shooting in general. You know, Aikens, Konadike thought Aikens would be a good shooter. I wasn't sure, but he's been a 40-plus shooter. So, we had a story last night at SpartanMag.com about this being, right now it's the third best, the second best three-point shooting team of the Izzo era behind the one that lost to Middle Tennessee State with Brent Forbes and Valentine. And McQuaid was on that team as well. I think McQuaid was on that team. I wrote it last night, but I've already forgotten. Let's see. I think, I think we're going to go out. We're not going to get... Let me see here. I'm going to tell Conan Dyke, get him at about 10. But before we go to... Uh, Before we go to Nils, our good buddy down there in Texas, let's go over here to the comments area. Rob South, he's in first. I think it's the second show in a row that Rob South is in first. Appreciate Rob South. Matt Latham, hockey expert extraordinaire. You can tell he's fired up. He's in second. He's fired up about Michigan State beating Notre Dame two games to one in the Big Ten hockey quarterfinals Big Ten tournament last weekend in South Bend. Notre Dame got a one nothing lead all three games. Michigan State came back in Game 2 and Game 3 to get it done. They're moving down to Minneapolis this weekend to take on the best team in the country, Minneapolis and the Minnesota Gophers on Olympic ice, wide ice. 
Minnesota, what are they, like 25-7 and seven this year, something like that? Played Michigan State four times. And um, they pretty much uh, cleaned Michigan State's clock every time. Michigan State was competitive with pretty much everybody they played all year. Now they lost 5 nothing to Notre Dame once way back in the fall. Lost to Wisconsin late in the season 6-2. Michigan handled them once, I think, easily. But basically every team that beat them, Michigan State came back and even the score or competed with everybody but did not compete with Minnesota. If Penn State had beaten Ohio State in the other quarterfinal, then Penn State, they reseed. Penn State would have been going to Minnesota and Michigan State would be going to Ann Arbor for a one-game knockout, punch-out uh, semifinal. Michigan State at Michigan and Ann Arbor, Big Ten semifinal would have been great. And that one, I mean, Michigan would be favored. They've got great talent. But Michigan State, it's close. To, it's almost a coin toss on that one. Michigan State could very well have beaten Michigan and gotten into the Big Ten title game. And that winning that one might have gotten them enough juice in the pairwise rankings to get in. So Penn State losing to Ohio State in Game 3, and there's no reseed, so Michigan State goes to Minnesota. That much, that difference right there. I, I don't. It's gonna be very difficult to beat Minnesota in this sport in hockey. I mean, anything can happen. It's it's built for upsets, right? So it's possible. But Michigan versus Michigan State would have been delicious with ever, with so much on the line. And Michigan State having a chance to win, not only to go to the finals, but also would probably punch their ticket. Maybe. Dang, that would have been a nice nice hockey game in Ann Arbor on Saturday, but it's not meant to be. Clark Marier checking in from Sylvania, Ohio. Dog Kenneth. Down river in the house. I don't know if we've ever had Dog Kenneth in the starting five. It's good to have him there. I like his attitude. Dog Kenneth is showing all the proper, all the proper emotions, intensity, attention to detail, urgency, all those things. Spartan AG 999 rounds out the starting five. Rob South, he's got the ball. He's here early. He's running the point. Matt Latham, pretty boy two guard, stroking it from deep. Clark Marier. With a name like that, maybe you're the pretty boy. I know it's Marier, but you've told us before that you don't mind calling, calling you Marier on this show, and I think it's pretty cool. Clark Marier, that sounds like a... Actually, that's kind of a tough name for hockey. That sounds like a, uh, a power forward grinder for like the New York Islanders in 1978. So I'll go back on that. Clark Marier is a tough name. I'm going to... I'm going to retract that statement. So I got Clark Mary, his power forward down there banging around. He's got like elbow pads on, knee pads. He's got a face mask on that you wear when you get your broken nose in, in, in basketball. He's got a mask on. He doesn't even have a broken nose. He's just wearing a mask for the hell of it. And he's got a, a sweatband, sweatbands on his wrist. And he's just a spaz out there. He's running the, he's the power forward. And he can shoot it. Don't sleep on the J with Clark Mary. And Dog Kenneth, he's, he's the wing and Spartan AG9. No, no, no. Dog Kenneth has got to be my five. Between Marie and Kenneth, it's uh, Bruce Brothers down there, and it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Spartan AG, then you're, you're the wing, so that's a starting five. Brad Fashenko, checking in from Austin, Texas. Thank you, Brad, for everything I emailed you a couple days ago. You know what I'm talking about. Thanks, my man. Appreciate it. Zachary Reinhart, checking in from Denver, Colorado. Jack, Jake Z says, JC, what's up? Steve Myers says, hi, Jim, viewing from McKinney, Texas. Go green. So we got two guys from Texas. A couple of guys from Colorado, Don Strait, Dominic Meads says Hogarth is third team. Hogarth was third team? Damn, I wrote it wrong then because I thought he was honorable mention. You got me freaking out about that. Let me call Nils, bring him on. There we go, should be on. He's going to have, he always has some great uh, insights on Michigan State football and basketball. <laughs> Nil, oh. Nils, don't don't break any dishes, man. Nils Deco, you are on the air right now. How'd you know I was? How'd you know I was doing that? Because I, I could hear that. the dishes. What do you think? I, come on, man. That's good. You can break anything you want. It's 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 March Madness. Getting getting to that time. If you if you're breaking things, we understand. His name is Nils Deco. No, I'm good. I'm good. Nils I'm, Deco. I'm in a good place. Founder of the Texas Top 100, the JUCO Advocate, formerly of the Horn in Austin, Texas. Now he's keeping an eye on things in Houston, Texas. Let me ask you, first of all, Houston Cougars, number one in the country. I heard Kelvin Sampson today say that Shed, is it Jamal Shed? What's his name, the guard? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, the kid that we tried to recruit a little bit, DJ came down to Texas to see him. He liked him. Tough but we guard. we had Jalen Terry at the time. The issue was at that time we had Jalen Terry already. And so 
we Michigan State had to kind of tread around that whole situation. And like when when they got Hogard, you know, that kind of I don't know what happened there, but you know, Hogard and Shed were kind of you know plan B and plan C at that time. And then you can see that Shed and Hogard are you know they're pretty good point guards, and Jalen Terry is you know on somebody's you know milk carton. Mm-hmm. Interesting how those things turn out. Shed is a guy that was in your um, youth program down there in the Austin area, right? Well, I've known, I've, you know, when I first started doing youth basketball in 19, or what year was it? 2005, he would have been, oh, he would have been two or three. And so he would be at our events. He was in diaper. I mean, he would have been dribbling around the basketball. He's three years old, just, as, you know, a little tight and just ornery as it gets. And, you know, little do you know that he's the number one, you know, he's the point guard of the number one college basketball team in the country you know, 17 years later. I mean, it's just amazing how things work out or 18 years. It'll be 18 years since, since we've been doing this. So it's been 18 years since I've known him. And I mean, uh, you know, just a good kid, a great family, you know, always, you know, about his family was always about kind of the community on the East side of Austin. And, you know, the kid's just a winner. I mean, he just, you can see that shot that he hit against Memphis the other day and he's only getting better. I mean, he had, he had the huge game against Alabama early in the year. He had 19 points. He was right. You know, I think the NBA scouts really are going to view that game as a game kind of to, you know, elevate him to the next level. Cause I just think he's going to be, he reminds me of Mookie Blaylock. If you remember Mookie Blaylock from, you know, Oklahoma back in the day, yes, they look similar. I don't know if they, but they're just tough guards, athletic, physical. Cause I mean, if he played football, I mean, he could be a division one. I mean, he could be an NFL strong safety, I think. I mean, he's got great shoulders, great lateral quickness, just tough, smart. I mean, he would be in the NFL, but basketball, you know, you can last a little bit longer. And his dad was a good football player. His uncle was probably one of the best athletes Austin's ever seen, Jason Shedd, who he played baseball, basketball, football. I mean, he was the division one athlete in all sports, basically. I heard Kelvin Sampson today say that Shedd is the smartest player he's ever had. That's pretty cool. How you like them apples? I like it. You know, what's how, how good is, is Houston? So, how good is Houston? What, what, what if Michigan State ran into Houston in the Elite Eight? What would that, or the in the in the that that might be a no that that'd be like a that'd be an Elite Eight opponent because I think Michigan State's gonna be around a six or something like that. I mean, the physicality is the concern for Michigan for me with Michigan State and Houston because Houston's so physical and they just you know all their dudes are big and strong. Shed's big. Sasser's big. Uh, the the kid, the freshman from IMG is big. Uh, each, uh, I mean, they just, they're just so physical. I mean, you know, they're what Michigan State was 20 years ago with Antonio Smith and Hudson. They're kind of a uh, modern day version of Michigan State basketball. I mean, they're just so physical. And what they do such a good job of is offensive rebounding. I think Samson's done a better job than anybody of adapting to how, where the ball comes off. If you notice, when they offensive rebound, they don't have anybody inside the paint. Everybody is the elbow extended, and they attack. When the ball goes opposite, they're going to get it. They get a lot of loose rebounds opposite mm-hmm. that just fall in that little short corner, right? Mm-hmm. And you notice, like, if that ball's on the right corner, or on the right, you know, wing, and you're shooting it, if it goes long, it's going to be on that left short corner. And they 100%. do a great job of attacking that. Mm-hmm. So I think, I think Michigan State – that's the one thing I don't think Michigan State's adapted to over the years is mm-hmm. that understanding offensive rebounding like we used to. Like Michigan State old school rebound, it was in the lane, we'd go in it, go get it, they'd hammer it, they'd hammer it, they hammer it, and they'd get the ball. But now it's just, you know, you can't do that because the ball's going to come off long nine times out of ten if you're shooting, you know, 20 or 33 pointers. I mean, you can see the, the three pointer that uh, against Michigan where Hauser missed the one, uh, the one against Iowa where mm-hmm. we didn't rebound. Long rebound. I mean, I mean, it's just knowing where that ball is going to come off of, and that's the hardest part when you know when teams are shooting three pointers. I mean, you have to kind of work yourself outside in instead of the old way of inside out. Right, and Michigan State, with uh, with their rebounding this year, just been around fifty fifty. Izzo mentioned that in the press conference on Monday that he wants to get back to being better on the boards. Michigan State does not send four to the offensive boards anymore. And they've not done that in a few years, uh, just because they're worried about runouts they just didn't think it was you know um the cost benefit analysis of it was negative as it turned out occasionally here and there in a certain situation they might turn them loose but for the most part they're three three and a half to the boards but 
rebounding, you know, what, what do you think about Michigan State? They want to try to turn the rebounding around. Izzo thinks that if they get their defense turned around, then the rebounding will come and then fast break will come. You think this team can ever rebound well this year again, considering got it's tournament time now, and when you get into the NCAA tournament, they won't I mean, be Big Ten opponents, but for for a while. But what do you what do you think with Michigan State rebounding here going forward? I think Malik Hall is the key. I mean, and and Jaden Akins. I think those two guys need to be plus rebounders because I think the problem with Hauser is I think he's played too many minutes and he gets himself in a situation where he's out of sorts. And he's, I, you know, you go back to the Michigan game, you go back to the Iowa game. I'm not saying he lost the games, but they were critical situations where he was not able to come up with a loose ball. He was in the spot, but he wasn't able to come up with a loose ball. I mean, in both those situations, if he gets both of those loose balls, Michigan State is mm-hmm. what? What's the record right now? They're probably, they're right, you know, they're what? They'd be 21 and nine overall, I mean, and they would be, instead of 11 and eight, they'd be 12 and seven. They'd be 13 and six. Yeah, I mean, but Michigan State's that close, so you, mm-hmm. as you well know. I mean, but I just think Hauser's had to play too many minutes, and you know, you can only do so much. I mean, he's he's spend... one guy that it really seems to have an impact on. He, there, there's like a point of diminishing returns with him after about 33, 34 minutes. But he played. He played, the last he, played games... he played 35 or 36 against Ohio State. Played less against mm-hmm. Nebraska and was better. Played a little too much, probably against. Iowa, and that's that's Izzo's words, not mine necessarily, but that's an interesting study for sure. Because I think against Nebraska, then you can see the difference him in the second half than Ohio State. But Ohio State was so physical, was sensible, so much. I mean, and those he's, he's one standing, guy that are, they realized like they were going to attack Michigan State physically, and that's how they got back in the game late. Because mm-hmm. I mean, sensible is the most. I don't know where he came from, but I mean, if that guy stays in college basketball another year or two, I mean, gosh darn, I mean, he's a hard. I mean, he's a hard deal to cover. I mean, you can see it. I mean, Michigan State was out on him 17, 18 feet, and he should go to the top of him. And he's what every bit of 6'6", 235. He's, I mean, he's a problem. And so I think the physicality, but so you, you got to figure out what teams are physical, right? Yeah. Houston's physical, right? Yeah. They're not highly skilled, though. So, you know, Sasser, I don't think he's gotten much better. I think his ceiling, it's kind of hit his ceiling. You'll see that he probably won't be a big time NBA product. And if you notice about Houston, right? Their guys aren't really NBA. Like, Jamal Shedd's not going to be an NBA starter. Like, they are good college basketball players. Now, the kid that came from IMG, what's his, I can't remember his name, Drace Walker, Walker. And then you've got the Arsenal kid who's from Beaumont United, who's about 6'7", who's probably their 7th or 8th man. Those are probably their two NBA best NBA prospects. But, you know, Shedd doesn't shoot it well enough probably for a lot of NBA people. And then Sasser really hasn't gotten much better this year. He's good, but... You know, people expect him to take the next step. But, you know, with Trayvon Mark, who's a 6'6 wing out of Dickinson, who's just south of from where I – here in Galveston County, where I live, you know, he was on a team, you know, he's a big wing. But, you know, the thing is that Samson, he, he has a lot of Izzo stuff in them. Yeah. They're just physical and they take it to you. And so I'd rather Michigan State play them in the Final Four. Not really because if, if – if, we're, if Michigan State's playing Houston in the Final Four, there's going to be 90,000 Cougar fans in that mm. building. But the, the, the later, the better. The later, the better, matchups wise, right? Yeah. But and you know, when, when I, I and uh, people are going to be sit, filling out brackets on Sunday and they might be listening to this wondering about Houston themselves, you know, like you say, the athletic, but they do the way, you know, Samson says they're smart guys too, which allows them to take it to the next level defensively in terms of team concepts. I remember when they played Michigan in the Sweet 16 a few years ago, uh, just the way they could switch everybody and, and that, that kind of gave. You know, Michigan beat him at the buzzer, um, but Houston was still. They trap ball screens. They do something no one else does. They trap ball screens like they will bring their big out just to freeze it. Like they bring a big out there and just it kind of scares that point guard. You'll see it because they don't see it all the time. They'll bring that guy out there and they'll hedge so strong. Mm-hmm. They'll double team that ball screen. And you're like, what the heck just happened? To and me? it really pushes and that it, point guard off the just yeah. wipes him off the map, right? Yep. I mean, you're like, what just Tommy happened? Emmaker's teams used to do that at Michigan, and I thought that was pretty effective. I, I'm surprised more But they teams... weren't as physical. you got to be physical to do it and make mm-hmm. it work. It's like, you know, it's uh, it's all about body blows, as you all know. I mean, it's like our boy John. What's that guy that just won the uh, the Michigan State guy, the MMA guy? What's his name? What, the John Jones? Yeah, is he a Michigan State guy? No. He was a okay. junior college wrestler. And then he quit How wrestling to go to M- and to get uh, MMA. Um, you're probably Sorry. you're thinking of – uh, Thinking of Rashad Evans as a few years yeah, earlier. I've anyway. been lying to people then. Oh well. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Um, all right. So Michigan State basketball been shooting well. 
We were talking about this the other day when you and I were texting. And I wrote the story last night. Is this Izzo's best three-point shooting team? Now, that team with Bryn Forbes and Valentine statistically was better. But this team is... I don't know if a team has ever, under Izzo, had a three-game stretch like this. What are they shooting? Like 68% from three-point range the last three games? I wrote it somewhere. I don't know what it is. Something like That's that. That's ridiculous. It's I mean, insane. It's, ridiculous. it's It's not nice. And, you know, Hauser, I mean, it's a, for right now he's open three-pointer. It's a layup right now with him. I mean, they can't stay that hot from three-point range. They just can't. I mean, 40 But they don't ever shoot any contested. I mean, that's the one thing, though, I think. You know, you, you say that, but it's not like they're shooting contested threes. It's like their offense is so good. They share the basketball so well. They make that extra pass. Like, everyone makes the extra pass mm-hmm. on this team. It's like – you know, you don't get the contested shot. You can just get that extra pass, and all of a sudden, you got Joey Hauser, you got Jaden Akins on the left wing, or you've got, you know, even AJ Hogard hit those two threes this last game against Ohio State. I mean, like his shot is so much better. Yeah, than he's like, he's getting up close to thirty one. He's getting up close to thirty one percent from three right now. Which and it comes that, out of his hands so much better. I mean, like yeah. all of a sudden, this guy. I mean, his it comes out of his hands so much cleaner than it used to. I tell you what, I was watching them practice today, and. The average fan would be astounded with just college basketball players when they warm up and are shooting like uncontested three pointers. How many of them they make? It looks like NBA three point contests. They're just making shots, making shots, making shots. Everybody, Trey Holloman, medium range, boom, boom, boom. Now it's different in a game, of course, defense, and you're rushed a little bit more, but skill level is good. And then some on this team, statistically, we're seeing that. Now, I mean, you're starting to hear Michigan State talked about nationally a little bit. If you listen to some of the national podcasts, they're starting to take notice of Michigan State. They've been under the radar nationally for a long time. Outside of the top 25, they've been an also-ran. So now people are starting to wake up to it a little bit, and they look into the look into the statistics and know that Tom Izzo's running it. Um, I don't know what's going to happen this weekend. It wouldn't surprise me if Michigan State makes a nice little run. You know how I am about the Big Ten tournament. I'm not a big fan of it in terms of preparing. No, you like to lose on Saturday and get home so you can you can watch the selection show. Win one, lose one, go home. That's the best thing you can do. Unless you are just so good that you can win and handle it. Like, you know, Cassius Winston's team or Mateen Cleaves' senior team or his junior team. They were just good enough to go through it, strong enough, deep enough, then they come back the next week. Doesn't matter who, when, where, whatever, go do it. This team... You know, not as physical, finesse type of team. Izzo kind of made a comment about that. He says, you know, the Big Ten tournament, it's fun. It gets the fans together, all that. It's nice to win. We're competitive. It's, you know, these days Michigan State does put the banners up when they win Big Ten tournament championships. They've won six of them more than anybody else. For a long time, Michigan State did not have any banners up there. And Izzo was like lukewarm about whether to do it or not. And he was talked into it. You know, he didn't have to twist his arm to do it. I'd like to ask him at some point who, who it was that – put those up they're probably mark hollis but they're up there now and there's a lot of banners up there of all all sorts and all kinds so you know he's proud of those wins and stuff but he said at the press conference on monday he didn't make a big point about it he just as, a, as an aside said you know the the sunday game i like the big 10 tournament I, but i can see why katie and and knight and those guys didn't want to have it back in the 90s when we were voting on it and he voted with them just because he, he wanted them to like him you know, so he, he voted he voted against it. Lon Kruger was in favor of it. They had it when he was at Kansas State in the Big Eight. So, long story short, Big Ten adopts the conference tournament, the last major conference to have one. Well, I guess Pac-12 still didn't have one. And he, you know, he he says it's an okay thing for the fans. You know, it's good to get out there and all that stuff. He says he's still not sure about that Sunday game because the bracket's already set. Whether you win it or lose that game, it, it has no impact on your seeding in the NCAA tournament. So why are we playing it? He didn't say why are we playing it, but why are we playing it? Yeah, the, you know, CBS gets some money. Some of that goes back to the Big Ten, whatever. Um, he thinks that game, he didn't come out and say it, but that game is worthless. You get a banner and you can celebrate for like 41 minutes. And then the brackets come out. And this is the problem. And he said, you know, that he was making the point, that they, he wanted to practice hard this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And he told his players, give me these three days of practice because three, these three days can last you for three weeks. And these are the last days that you can really practice on us and we can really work on ourselves because once the Big Ten tournament starts, then it's Selection Sunday, you might be playing on Sunday and your name might come up to go to Sacramento on Thursday. And I've always said the worst 
combination is playing Sunday and going out west on Thursday. And that's sitting yep. that's sitting right there. I if if I if I knew what the brackets were right now for the NCAA tournament, and you told me right now that Michigan State is going to Sacramento to play on Thursday, I would say dump that Saturday game like 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 counterfeit minute money. Does that make sense? I got drop that. I don't even but here's the problem. You might be playing Michigan on that day. So you gotta beat them, right? And then you're playing Sunday for nothing except a banner. I mean, it's it's good. It's kind of, but I mean, Sunday, Thursday. I'm just telling you, it's that's what Ohio State did. Did uh, Michigan State play Ohio- to Purdue too, right? Having to Purdue as well. Happened to Iowa. I don't know if it's a Sunday, Thursday when Steve Alford's team won it, and then they went and lost to Northeastern State out of Louisiana in the first round. I don't know if that was a sun. I think that was a Sunday, Thursday turnaround. Ohio State definitely back in the. What happened to Iowa last year? What what was? Did they play Thursday or Friday? They might have. I don't know. I don't know what it was, but they won the Big Ten tournament. And they were just god awful in the first. Yeah, I can't remember if there was a Sunday, but Sunday, Thursday, going out west, it doesn't get any worse than that. And this team. Well, will that's be- back to when Michigan State, when uh, the Draymond team that got beat by Louisville. Yeah, and Michigan State came back home, or they flew to Columbus, I think, and then Louisville stayed out west. I can't remember what the deal was on that one, but. That ended up costing Michigan State. It definitely did. And that's the only time I can remember since the tournament went to 64 teams, then 68. It's the only time I I can think of. They might have done it for one year or two years. Usually, if you play on a Thursday in the first round, you're playing on a Thursday in the second round. They don't mess mess with that. Why is there such a concern about going to Sacramento? I mean, I can't – is that a six or is that a seven? What is that? I don't know. They don't don't, – If that's not – determined yet that's just that's that's one of the regions that are out there for anybody you know just randomly it could be any team could be Michigan they could be anybody I don't know I mean it might not happen they might be what are the other ones Albany Columbus and a few others so that one with Draymond Green's team Draymond Green you know Brandon Dawson got hurt regular season finale they lose to Ohio State devastating I thought that he was hurt that day because they were playing their best basketball of the year for those opening 17 minutes of that first half. That was 2012, right? Yeah. What year was that? Yeah. Austin Thornton was a senior, came out of nowhere to really shoot like 45% from three. Draymond Green took over and was great. After the 2011 team was really bad and dysfunctional, got rid of you know some of those guys that were kind of um, not Draymond speed on a lot of things. So Draymond Chris took Allen, over. Chris Allen, Corey Lucius. Yeah, and Darrell Summers and some others. Well, Darrell so, graduated, though. He was on the 11 team, I think. But he graduated, though. That's why he went on the 12 team. That's right. What I'm saying. Yes. Like Chris Hill and Corey Lucius should have been on that 2012 team. Chris right? Allen. Chris Allen and Corey Lucius. Yes. They were kind of broomed out, transferred out. So that team loses Brandon Dawson as a freshman, goes to the Big Ten tournament on fumes, and wins the Big Ten tournament. Brandon Wood, the transfer from Valpo, ended up having a good tournament shot well, and they they – they really, you know, they, they go to like the, the playing group of six or seven players. So it's a smaller playing group. They max out and they very emotionally win the Big Ten Tournament Championship. That was great. A lot of people were picking them to win the NCAA Tournament. I'm like, man, they just lost Brandon Dawson. They are, you know. So then, then they played Friday, Sunday in Columbus. And the Sunday game, I think, was against St. Louis. I think it was St. Louis and Rick Majerus in Columbus. And that was a war, right? So it ends on Sunday evening, and then there's tornado warnings in Columbus. So Michigan State's like stuck in the airport for a couple hours. They don't get back to East Lansing until like midnight on Sunday. And they don't play Sunday, Friday, like every tournament has always been in the history of NCAA tournament. That region, that year, Sunday, Thursday, thank you very much, halfway into the tournament. Sweet 16, you're going Sunday, Thursday. So they get, they're sore. They get out of bed on Monday, and you know, they walk through a little bit. And they're flying, you know, on Tuesday, they have a, a crappy practice in East Lansing, and they're on, the, they're on the back in the air, flying to uh, Arizona, another, you know, four-hour flight. But, yeah, you're right. Louisville played Thursday, Saturday, played a Thursday, Saturday in the first round. So they had an extra day, and they were already out west. And, you know, Louisville, they don't have to go to class, right? So they wisely stayed out west, less travel, and – Michigan State a man down. Louisville was good, went to the Final Four that year. Uh, but Michigan State lost by about 13 or 14 but and, and ran out of gas, scored like 45 points. But that was solely, the, the margin of victory in that was solely on legs and exhaustion and scheduling and travel. It was worth 
a touchdown or 10 points in that game. And it's just, it's just crappy. Izzo doesn't talk about it a lot because it sounds like he's complaining, so I'll talk about it. But that, yeah, that was that one. So this year, Big Ten tournament on a Sunday. If that winner goes to Sacramento on a Thursday. So Mich- uh, Ohio State, way back in the Cleves era, back when Ohio State had um, the kid from River Rouge um, and some others, had a real good Darby. team. What was his name? Darby, yeah, Brent, Brent Darby, yeah. I think he was on that team. They yeah, they, they they competed they competed hard with Michigan State. Both made the Final Four in 1999. It might have been 2000. I can't remember what year it was. But Ohio State, I think, might have won the Big Ten tournament in 01. And they went Sunday, Thursday out west. And I want to say got beat by Utah State in the first round. Something like that. It's it's treacherous. It's The, the tournament is treacherous enough. Those things like that. If Michigan State gets Purdue on Thursday, of course, if you're a Michigan State fan, you want Purdue. You want to beat Purdue. You lost to him twice. You want to settle that score. You want, you know, what, as a competitor, you want to play and win and all that stuff. But I'm saying right now, if you go to and you lose to Purdue, you know, 76, 72 on Saturday, dude. If I'm a Michigan State fan, I'm over it in five seconds. That's fine. Uh, Kelvin Sampson said that today in that same interview today. You know, they kind of asked him about the the conference tournament coming up this weekend. What are you looking forward to? He says, I want to get out. Of, I want to be healthy on Sunday. That's all he said. He, you know, winning the conference tournament. He says, the guys want to do it. You know, they're competitive. When you, when you throw the ball up, you're trying to win. He says, my number one goal is I'm hoping we're, we're healthy on Sunday. And a lot of coaches would probably think that way. And some of these tournaments like ACC and Big East, they wrap up on Saturday. They're smart to wrap it up a day. That extra day can mean a lot. And I'll be interested to see what happens with Michigan State this weekend. Will there be rust or whatever? Probably not. But I mentioned this earlier in the show. Michigan State, this past weekend, played at home at noon. I already mentioned this to the, to the listeners earlier in the show. Everybody else in the Big Ten played on Sunday. Some played Sunday evening. You know, Michigan and Indiana, was, they were done at like 8 o'clock. You, know, you get out of there at 9, you're flying home at 10, you probably get back to Ann Arbor at midnight. By that time, Michigan State had played at noon on Saturday at home. I mean, they're in recovery mode by 4 o'clock in the afternoon. You know what I'm saying? On Saturday? So they had it was run- like Rutgers and Northwestern play that game late on Sunday. I mean, I so, mean so, Rutgers, lucky, so Rutgers and Michigan are even in that regard. But I'm talking about Michigan State. They have all afternoon on Saturday, all evening to recover, and then a good, slow home day on Sunday, whatever they did, and then they really got after it on Monday. Think about Michigan and Indiana. What kind of practices did they have on Monday? After that battle, you know what I mean? Does they this make sense? Who, yeah, had, who had a better? Who in the Big Ten had a better practice on Monday than Michigan State? Nobody, I promise you, because everybody played on Sunday. Does this make sense? Tuesday, Michigan. I think Michigan State practiced twice today. So by the time Friday rolls around, Michigan State will have had six days off. Is that too much? I mean, you're playing Iowa. Iowa's already had a game. Maybe they're hot. Maybe Michigan State comes out cold, loses, and goes home. But if Michigan State wins that game on Friday, on Saturday, if they get Michigan. It'll be Michigan's third game in three days. It'll be Michigan State's, you know, it'll be Michigan's also their fourth game since counting Sunday, whereas it'll be Michigan State's, you know, second game or third game in in seven days. Michigan State will be will be more rested and have an advantage if they play Michigan again. That being said, I think Michigan's pretty good. That doesn't guarantee a victory, but I think this is a rare case in, in which Michigan State um, – Legs wise and rest wise should be an advantage. We'll see if they take advantage of it. What 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 impresses you about this Michigan State team right now? What worries you? What, where, where's this thing going? Are you? I've been talking Sweet Sixteen for a few weeks. People thought, said I was crazy. Now I'm thinking Sweet Sixteen. You got to see the 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 brackets, of course. But I think well, the thing is, that uh, Sweet State Sixteen like, is a good, is a very good season. It's a very good season. Have, I think this team we, can go beyond that. Have we ever? You know, they got to get their defense the, together. Have we in the last 25 years ever had a team like this, you know, that didn't have the physicality that maybe was trending downward, you know, in the wrong direction on defense? Um, you know, I just don't, I don't know. I just, you know, I just, I think this team, it's a, it's, you know, it's a fun team to watch just, you know, it, but are we, you know, we're going to get tricked. You know, that's the whole mm-hmm. thing is like, okay, we're going to get tricked. And Michigan State goes four for 24 like they did in the first half against Nebraska the other night. And you're down 15 points to a middle Tennessee state again. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, you know, you don't, you can't guard Giddy Potts. You can't guard Upshaw. And you're like, what the heck? But I think, I think this year, the good thing is if you think about the defensive guys, Akins and Malik Hall are kind of like the X factors defensively. Mm-hmm. 
because one's big and physical. The other one's as athletic as he's going to get, right? Mm -hmm. So they can go counter somebody. If you got somebody that's hot, it's either one. I think one of those two dudes will always be the guy that you try to figure out, okay, can he guard that guy, right? So, you know, if I think those are the two dudes on the team. And, you know, they split time and, you know, they don't play a lot together. I mean, yeah, sometimes they do when we go, when Michigan State goes small. But those are the two dudes that, you know, can give you what you need. Like, so if you think about Michigan State with that team that, you know, Marvin uh, Clark should have been guarding Upshaw. I mean, Malik Hall would guard Upshaw if, we were, if Michigan State was playing Middle Tennessee State today, right? Yeah, and that team did not have – the mismatch for defender. And I, I said that in the V cast the night before the middle Tennessee game. And I well, said, this guy did, Upshaw, Kenny Goins had the bad knee. Remember well, Kenny got, Goins was young. Slipped. I mean, Kenny Goins only, he, he only averaged 10 minutes a game back then, but you're right. He got injured that day. And, and he would have been, he'd been the one guy that could have counteracted it. And then the problem was, Izzo got mad at Marvin Clark and, and you know, tried was, to get him back in the game. And Izzo was stubborn on the deal. He was so mad at Marvin Clark that he couldn't see straight. And so Garland tried to get him back in the game because he was the one dude that was physical enough with Upshaw that maybe could have counteracted that, some of that stuff in the second half. And then maybe he could have got back in the game and won. But Giddy Potts was too physical, though, too. I mean, still one of the greatest names that ever lived in you know, our history, Giddy Potts. I mean, they don't get any better than that. There were some, uh, some turnovers by Michigan State in that game that were – that were uncharacteristic. You know, Denzel Valentine had made that statement that he predicted they'd win the national title. He's kind of coaxed into doing it by a media member. Well, they, I thought they played for too a fast media member season. that I've got a lot of respect for, but we it was talked about a couple of weeks ago, actually. There was one time when uh, I think Bryn Forbes, someone someone sent an outlet pass to Bryn Forbes and it went out of bounds. And I'm like, the, Bryn Forbes is not the guy you, you give the outlet pass to. It was like the only time all season. I, it, and I can't remember who who did it, but just things were off. Meanwhile, the other team was shooting, and Michigan State had all the pressure on them, and that was just a, a terrible, terrible day. Now, the Big, the big that, Ten, I'm I'm I, but I also that. said the Big Ten that year did not have any power forwards that were stretch fours, mismatch fours. So that was Michigan State. It, it, it showed itself as a weakness. It didn't have to be a weakness because they had people capable of defending those guys, but they didn't see it on the schedule all year. There was that guy from Michigan. What was his name? Nick Irvin or something like that? Does that ring a bell? Yeah. What's high school Gary Harris, yeah. He, was a, he played the four for them, and he was a guy that would take you off the dribble. O- other than that, Michigan State did not face one all year because I was looking for it all year. Because, you know, I've got my checklist on what you have to get your – points of your crap you got to get together within 30 games and they weren't seeing it weren't seeing it and i saw a film of middle tennessee state you know after selection sunday the way we do on spartmag.com and i was like this guy upshaw is a stretch four and he can take you off the dribble and i don't know who guards him deontay davis is a freshman they've been trying to get you know deontay davis has the, is capable of playing good defense but he was never burned all year by anyone in the big 10 because the big 10 didn't have anybody that could do that and you need guys like that you need to play against guys like that so you can get your butt beat so you can learn some lessons get in the film room get in the practice floor in february like february 12th and have Izzo put his boot up your butt so you can become a better player and a better team that team the big 10 didn't service michigan state that way that year and oh crap, Middle Tennessee State had this guy up. Shaw had a big first half, and the dream was on. So Deontay Davis, I mean, played one year. You know, it's always hard to communicate with him. Marvin Clark had the ability to do it. That was his freshman year, right? Had the quickness, the athleticism, the strength. He could have been a guy that could play a mismatch for, like you said. Should have went back in. Um, actually, he was a sophomore at that time. Because Clark played a big, he made a big basket the the week the year before against Louisville in the Elite Eight at the Carrier Dome. Marvin Clark did, and so so Marvin Clark didn't get to play much in this Middle Tennessee State game. But a few days earlier in the championship of the Big Ten tournament against Purdue, I think it went to overtime. I don't know if it went to overtime or not. But Clark fouled out against Purdue. He played so much against Purdue. They they used all his fouls. He ended up playing like 14 minutes or something. And then next game against Middle Tennessee State, they're not trusting him to guard up Shaw. And I was like, man, that's kind of. And then you know, and then you know, Kenny Goins got a little bit hurt. They tried Colby Wallman, you know, in that game a little bit to play some defense. And Izzo, everyone knows I love him. I think he's great. He's enriched my life because I've covered his teams and I've gone to all these Final Fours and it's been awesome. I think he's outstanding. And when people rip on him, I'm usually ripping on the people ripping on him. But. um Usually during the season, you know, he's uh, 
He's making his coaching points known with the tough love like Izzo can do. Not, you know, it's quality control. Not letting it happen, getting it corrected, and sometimes it looks pretty damn grouchy. People people see it on TV and they 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 think he's they think it's abuse. They think it's too much. I see it in practice. It's and in practice, and people are wondering how do these players handle this in practice. It's just a, a fraction of that. He doesn't get nearly as mad as he does in, in games. He'll get mad for a second in practice, and then he's, he's real quick to smooth it over. And you wonder why these players come over and they got their arm around him and they, they like him and all that stuff. It's because most of the practice, it's serious, but he makes you like it that he's yelling at you like Gene Cady used to do. And then he's looking for a way to pat you on the back. He's, he's, he builds you up a lot in practice. That's what people don't see. Anyway, there'll be games like Big Ten Tournament. Like, he sat Darrell Summers down. They lost to Minnesota in the first round. One of those years, they ended up going to the Final Four, I think it was 2010. And Izzo, you know, he'd do that with Brandon Dawson. He'd do that with Nick Ward. He'd just flat sit someone down and maybe even blow the game and, and accept a loss to make a point. And that's kind of controversial. That's okay in February. It's even okay in the Big Ten tournament. To me, to me, my, my criticism would be, it's not okay once you get in the big dance. You got you to gotta run what you brung, to use an old NASCAR phrase, and to try to impress a coaching point upon Marvin Clark at that stage leaves you open to going ahead and losing to Middle Tennessee State. That's, that's, I mean, I'd have to go back and look at the whole thing again, but that would be my one observation if, if someone were to ask me about that whole thing. So how did we get into that whole thing? What were we talking uh, just, about? Oh, you know me. I'd like to. i like to. I like to go on tangents. But uh, so you're asking about. One, but that team was a, was very much a jump shooting team. Valentine was jump shooter. He could drive, score. Brent Forbes, one of the great ones. Costello, he could give you a little bit in the in the post. Um, gave you quite a bit in the post, actually. You know, Aaron Harris was part of that team. Deontay Davis was a guy that could you know medium range jump shot guy. But in terms of how they ran their stuff. They were very much a jump shooting team like this one this year. So but let's talk about turnovers though, because that's one thing I was thinking about as you were talking. The turnover, I mean, I, I think Michigan State had eight turnovers the other day against yeah. uh, Ohio State. Turnovers have been a problem for Michigan State, probably, I'd probably eighty percent of Izzo's tenure, I would think. This team doesn't turn the ball over recently. Not I mean, recently, recently. So all of a sudden, you know, your, your shooting percentages go up. You're not turning the ball over 15, 16 times. You turn it over eight times, like. You know, when and here's something Michigan State hasn't had. When was the last time Michigan State had two guys that were lead guards? Not point. I mean, yeah, AJ Harger's more of a point guard than Tyson Walker. But Tyson Walker, did you hear the stat that Hummel said the other day? What, what, what Hummel, Robbie Hummel? What did he say? He said under five seconds. I think Tyson Walker has. I don't know what his stats are, but uh, under five seconds in terms of hitting shots, number one in the Big Ten. Tyson Walker, like shot clock inside of five seconds? Yes, inside of five seconds. I think there were like, 30 opportunities, and he's number one in the Big Ten by far. That he's made the most, or his percentage yes, is the he's best? Yes, made the most. It's, yeah, same thing. Yeah. I mean, what he does under, and, you know, that's the thing, though. He's so good at it, and I think that's what he does a great job of going inside, outside. You get him inside the lane. You can you can play him off the right, you know, the right elbow, the left elbow. He's just, he's so nifty. And I don't know if you go back, go back and watch the game when Jay Wright, did the call? I think it was with Raftery. It was with, I think it might have been the Purdue game, right, where we got Michigan yeah. State got blown out. But yeah. you know, Tyson Walker is a Christ the King kid, right? So, yes. I mean, Jay Wright knows who he was, who he is, and yeah. the kid, you know, has developed into a you know second team All Big Ten guy that you know got recruited Northeastern and did a great job his first two years and done an amazing job at Michigan State. Like I was. Like I mentioned on the board the other day, like his three point percentage the last two years, I think at Michigan State in conference, like forty four or forty five percent. I mean, mm -hmm. that's ridiculous. I mean, and the, it's not like he's coming off a bunch of down screens, a bunch of pin downs, like Brent Forbes did. Like he creates. I mean, a lot of his stuff he does on his own. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the late, I've never seen a guy in the second half. He's so much better at shooting in the second half than he is in the first half. Like against. The, Nebraska the other night, I'm thinking, okay, he's over four initially. Like, okay, is he going to be cold? He, I think he had four or five points in the first half. Second half, he does his, he has his 15 or 16, hits critical shots. And like, all his shots are critical. Like, he doesn't get a lot of easy garbage points. Like, the 15 points he averages a game, 
there are critical points every game. He doesn't get any weak pass points. You know what I'm saying? And you don't see him force any garbage either. I mean, it'd be no. it'd be very easy with as much as on is on his plate to you know even Sean Respert threw up some garbage here and there, right? And would apologize. Oh, that was too much. You know, uh, Walker is excellent. What's your gut feel? You think he's coming back next year? I don't want to jinx it. I was not even talk about it. If we get to if if, it, if we get to Houston, if Michigan State gets to Houston, then probably not. I think anything short of that, he might just say, you know what? He, you know, the problem is, you know, he's six foot one. He's one hundred eighty pounds. I mean, Cassius Winston's having to play in Munich, Germany, right now. Yeah. I mean, where's Tyson Walker going to play next year? Right? right. It'd be overseas. It'd be the G League. Either way, he wouldn't be making as much money as he possibly, theoretically deservingly should make at Michigan State next year with name, image, and likeness. Yeah. I would have to believe so, he, he, I mean, you know, you bring him back, then it's a whole different game. But I think, you know, but you have a guard like him. These are the type of guards that make a run in March that, you know, all yes. of a sudden they shoot up drafts. To, I mean, you know the kid's a good kid. I mean, there's not a better kid, even though he hates it. I don't know if you saw the other day against Nebraska. Who's the – what's the kid number 30 for Nebraska? The big, tall point guard? No, 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 no the guy from Japan. Oh, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, what about him? Oh, yeah, they were, they were jawing a little bit, weren't they? Yeah, he just says, shut the F up. Just shut the F up, he told that guy. Did he? And he just, yeah, he, he, I read his lips. I'm like, well, I don't see that at Tyson Walker. But that guy was driving us. He's just saying, shut the F up. I wonder, I wonder what he was saying. <laughs> oh, I, I he, hit that, he hit that three in his eye. You know when he turned his head yeah. and went back the other way? Yeah. And that big walker's like, I've had enough. <laughs> and that guy was in his ear, you know, senior night, and just he's like, shut the f up. <laughs> Good times. Hey, uh, before I let you go, your thoughts about uh, you saw the news, Nick Marsh decommitted. Your thoughts on that? I mean, I, football recruiting is just yeah. It's it's a hard it's a hard thing to track anymore. Yes, it is. I don't know how you. I mean, I, I mean, it's. I mean, just. I think. You've got to figure out the later the better. I don't think you want to be involved with a kid when he's a sophomore in high school or a junior in high school. Like, you know, just too many people. Like, once Michigan State puts their name on a dude, then everyone – I mean, it's not like Michigan State, you know, Nick Saban's going to look at him. You know, Kirby Smart's going to look at him. I, you know, the kid's a big-time athlete. But mm -hmm. I don't think – you're. I mean, is he as good as Andre Reiser or Mark Ingram Sr., you think? I'd have to look at him some more. A little different. He's a little more of a smooth guy. Go get it guy. You know, those guys, more like Ingram probably. You know, Ryzen was so, had so much burst. You know, he was just a bowling ball of energy. You know, I mean, he's 6'1", six, 6'2", six, whatever. But, you know, I, it'd be a lot I don't to put him I, in that I don't, I don't get worried about receivers decommitting because I think receivers, good point. you can find receivers. It's a good point. Right. I mean, if he was a quarterback, and he's a number one quarterback. Yeah, I would be concerned, but or a left tackle or a defensive tackle, you know, then I'd be concerned. But I mean, there there's more receivers than you know, you know, than ever in college football today. I mean, there's so many all seven on seven. I mean, you're gonna find a receiver. It's, if you don't have receivers, there's a problem. Right. I mean, you look at Jaden Reed, right? So Jaden Reed, right, under recruited, under recruited out of high school, right? Yes. From a metro, I mean, from a big city high school in, in Chicago, right? Naperville. Yes. I mean, it's not like, I mean, everyone knows where that high school is, right? Mm -hmm. So they miss on him. He goes to Western Michigan, right? Freshman All American. And he does what he does at Michigan State. And then he runs a 4 4 5 with a bad eye. And he's probably going to be either, what, a third, fourth, or fifth round draft pick, right? Blew up at the Senior Bowl. You know, but, you know. By the way, if, if Michigan State has him healthy all year, is it worth a win or two, I wonder? I mean, he was somewhat oh, healthy least. by the end of the I mean, year. That whole Akron, I mean, that was the whole thing. That's why you don't play. I mean, that's the thing with those MAC, those MAC level schools. You play those guys, and now it's even worse. The guys didn't get to – you've got the guys that transferred down and then the guys that, you know, think they should have been playing the Big Ten, right? And so he gets his, what, his back la – there's a laceration on his back because the bench is too close. Mm-hmm. I'm surprised I mean, that it hasn't happened before. You know, those walls are pretty close to the field. Yeah, I mean, like those someone benches. needs to put – like there shouldn't be any benches. Like the benches need to be in a spot like – Do they need I to mean, be Do they need to be metal in this day and age? I don't know. Age? What do you think? I don't know. It seems like somebody should come up with some sort of plastic. I don't know, but those are big guys. I don't know. But it's it's crowded I mean, in there. Yeah, because Keon Coleman doesn't catch all those balls against Washington and then, you know – 
I mean, Reed was never the same, I mean, for the most part, not right? Quite, not quite, no. And he's glad that, you know, probably kind of important. You know, I mean, putter, excellent, his, excellent receiver. Excellent. Kick return, big, return, you know, he wasn't the same person. Big time. Hey, Nils, I really appreciate you coming in and chopping it up with us here at Spartan Mag Live. We'll be talking appreciate to you, you maybe on Sunday, Selection Sunday. Uh, get your get your get your Selection Sunday boots on. Maybe we'll do this again on Sunday after the bracket comes out. Okay, I'm good. To. Thanks, Nils. Really appreciate it, man. Have a great night. You too, brother. There he goes. Appreciate Nils. Known him a long time. He's an astute Michigan State. He's, he's been a Michigan State observer for a long time, and as you can tell, he knows the game really well. So I value his opinion on things. It's great to have him here. I didn't get a chance to ask him. So uh, we already talked about Big, Big Don's question already. Let's go over here to the comments area see what's going on. J.J. McKay says, oh, he's asking Malcolm Jones. Malcolm Jones Sr. is in here. He says, is June ready for spring? Is he ready for spring practice? Looking forward to seeing him out there this year, hopefully. Uh, Malcolm Jones Jr. was a fresh, true freshman for Michigan State football team this year. Uh, defensive back from Georgia. Played in one game. Special teams. Might have been on the travel team a couple times at least. And uh, we'll, we'll see what he does this spring there's gonna be some competition there and they're excited about him Malcolm Jones senior says he told me he moved up to 4-2 nickel so he's in the nickel area and I'll make a note of that that's interesting you know that nickel area Chester Kimbrough started there last year and then um, you know, Angela Gross could possibly be a nickel guy. And last year, Michigan State played 4-3 against Wisconsin and Penn State. So Michigan State probably will have that flexibility to go 4-3 or 4-2-5, depending on the opponent, which only makes sense. So Malcolm Jones moving up to be the nickel. Uh, Keith Tunstall says, Pierre is the very reason why the Spartans will have a hard time winning the Big Ten Conference Tournament and have a hard time winning in the opening weekend of March Madness. Um, I appreciate your post. I'm not sure, you know, I mean, they're still working with him in practice and everything, but based on what we've seen, I don't think he's going to get any playing time. So I don't think he's going to do anything that's going to hurt Michigan State in the NCAA tournament because you got those longer TV timeouts you can shorten the bench. He's gotten a lot of opportunities in February and March and really has not had a he played well on defense for a few minutes, like six games ago. And he's trying. I saw him in practice today. He's giving forth the effort. And Izzo trying to keep him pumped up, keep him fluffed up. Uh, on Monday, Izzo said he still, he says, I still think Pierre Brooks is going to help us at some point. He's going to make some shots for us and help us. Um, that could happen maybe in the Big Ten tournament if you get into a situation where you're, well, you might not need him because you, you, you might play three games in three days against another team that's playing three games in three days. If Michigan State would have had to have been bounced down to the Wednesday game and had to play four games in three days, then someone like that might get more playing time or Carson Cooper, and you might need more out of him. But I just I don't see him getting on the court to make mistakes unless you are saying that, be, that he has not become the player they need him to be to send them farther in the tournament. I, would, I, I, I don't agree with that either necessarily, but I appreciate your opinion. I respect your opinion for sure. Zachy Reinhardt says, this Izzo team I think has something special. The schedule this year, tragedy, blown lead at Iowa. This is a gritty type of Izzo team with great guard play going into March. Malcolm Jones Sr. says he's getting ready to get a starting spot. Good to see confidence from Pops there. That's good. Tim Hughes says, Hogard, Walker, Aikens, hottest guard trio in the nation right now. I would agree with that, and man, you know, who, whoever gets Michigan State in the NCAA tournament, we will see what Michigan State does this weekend. But if they continue to play well, there'll be a time when, when whoever they draw in the NCAA tournament is going to turn on the film, and Michigan State will have not been in the top 25 for a couple of months, and they're going to look at it, and they're going to be like, holy crap, this Michigan State team is uh, a handful. By that time, it, that the secret might be out. By that time, everybody might know it if Michigan State wins the Big Ten tournament. Let's go. Ahead. Let's go. Let's see. Is 
If my producer were here, he could be doing this. But my producer's not here. Paul Konerdijk. Let's see. We've got. Uh, I assume he'll be he'll be answering. If not, hello. Hey, Paul Konerdijk, you are on the air. You are listening there. We're listening live. So, <laughs> thanks for coming aboard. We got Paul Konerdijk, associate editor, SpartanMag.com, veteran Michigan State basketball beat writer. How you doing tonight, Paul? I'm doing good. All right, man. Michigan State. Um, haven't talked to you. I don't think since uh, about Michigan State since the Saturday victory over. The Buckeyes. Since then, we see the Big Ten bracket coming out. Now, you and I had a had a long Spartan Mag uh, V cast from the court on the Breslin Center. You can find that here on the channel. Go check that out. Uh, Thirty minutes of serious basketball talk over there after that game. Senior day, interesting afternoon for the Spartans for sure. We didn't know the Big Ten brackets yet at that point. We do know them now. Michigan State, of course, got the double bye. They will play either Iowa or Ohio State or Wisconsin. Uh, your thoughts uh, on that bracket and what lies ahead for Michigan State potentially? Well, you know, I think, you know, Tom Izzo and like all those Michigan State guys that, you know, you like to complete your circles. Michigan State had a that game at Iowa that they had won. And for, you know, we've gone over this before, but for all those different reasons, they lost that game and it was kind of a crazy ending. But I think it works out well for Michigan State um, if they potentially have a chance to, to play Iowa again. I, I know if I was a player, I would want another shot at those guys. And, uh, but it's going to be a tough matchup. I, I've covered, you know, in person, the big 10 tournament for forever. And, and I'll tell you what, for Michigan state, when you look at what Michigan state has done there, they've won more big 10 tournaments than anybody in the conference having won six, but it's usually, you got to get past that first day. If you get past that first day in your Michigan state with a double buy, uh, chances are, you're going to be, uh, working your way into the championship game. That first day is the hardest day to play uh, because fatigue doesn't really set in with the Thursday teams uh, until Saturday, if they're able to advance and, and there's more upsets on that Friday than, uh, you know, than any other day in terms of uh, lower seated teams losing to uh, higher seated teams at Michigan state. I think it's a good deal that there's a chance to play Iowa again. And, and I think it gives them a chance to, you know, not just complete their circles, but also, uh, show some some progress in areas that they need to show progress. Um, you know, when I think of like some of the defensive switches that weren't very good in that in that game uh, down the stretch, it's one area where they can improve. I I was always tough to guard, but the one thing that really stood out to me in that game, um, besides you know what Michigan State did in offense, the, it's the simple fact that they gave up uh, 14 or 15 offensive rebounds in that game, and uh, you know that. Without those offensive rebounds, um, you know, that would have been a huge victory for Michigan State. It's a chance for them to, to, you know, not only do some good things on offense again against Iowa, but also show that they can make some improvements in areas that need to get tightened up. Uh, and they should be well-rested in this game, so there's no excuses uh, for whomever they play when it comes to rebounding and defense. They'll be fresh. What do you make about Michigan State's three-point shooting the last three games? It's re I'm not sure Izzo's ever had a stretch of three games of a team shooting like this. They obviously can't keep it up. Nobody in the history of the game has ever shot 60% three-point range going into a tournament and throughout a tournament and through the, through the championships into April. No one's ever done that, so that's not going to keep up. But what are you making of this? I mean, like well, every time Hauser's open a three-pointer, it looks like a layup right now. You know, like so I was watching all those Sunday games to kind of see how things would shake out. And, and I'm watching a lot of different things. And one of the things that, that stood out to me from a lot of teams that were supposed to be good three-point shooters is the way they're shooting threes. You see guys off balance and falling backwards and not stepping into shots. You see uh, passes uh, coming in not at great angles and, and guys having to readjust and shoot. And you, you see a lot of tire, tired legs. When I look at Michigan State, I see a team that is, uh, you know, the way they're shooting it, it's, it's not just making threes. Uh, they're getting the ball in, in great position to make threes. People are stepping into it. There's not like the off-balance chucker type threes. They're good shots. And it's not like they're shooting a super high volume of threes. They're making a lot, but um, they're coming off of good passes. They're coming off of the extra passes, the old hockey assist, as Izzo would call it. So in the shot selection is good. You're not seeing a lot of bad shots. And, uh, you know, I don't think Michigan State obviously can keep it up. There's no way they can, as you, as you just said, but they're not taking bad shots. And I think uh, I think that's one thing that's a little bit different about Michigan State than a lot of the other teams I've been watching, um, you know, whether it's conference tournaments or into season play. And they're just seeming like they're they're clicking 
you know, the way that they should have been clicking had if there hadn't been injuries. You know what I'm saying? I, mm-hmm. I, I just feel like a lot of teams are kind of staggering to the finish line. And Michigan State looks like they're in midseason form in terms of like, you know, kind of freshness and running their offense. All right. You'd posted a story a few minutes ago about uh, McCulloch, the, the, the young man from Cleveland, Lutheran East. Um, Jesse McCulloch visited Michigan State this past weekend, official visit. Uh, you just posted the story. Uh, you've spoke with some people close to him at coming out of the visit. What did you find out? Yeah, I text back and forth with Jesse today, and then I talked to his parents, uh, Lori uh, McCulloch and uh, Cedric McCulloch. And, you know, the, this is a deal where, you know, some people are looking at other guys that Michigan State's been recruiting, and there's some, like, other, like, highly ranked guys. But Jesse McCulloch's the dude that Michigan State has liked for a long time, and they've been in on for a long time, and he's had multiple unofficial visits to Michigan State, took his official visit last weekend. Uh, he's kind of like a – he's kind of one of those, like, stretch fours, a uh, 6'9", 220 kid, um, you know, plays for Spee Cindy Heat. I think Michigan State got a good look at him really early on in the in the process while also evaluating Jalen Harrelson, um, who also plays for the same uh, – plays for the same high school – or that same Spee Cindy Heat team. Harrelson is a big-time point guard out of Indiana. I think he plays – I think he's out of Fishers. But so Michigan State got a chance to look at him. And, uh, you know, like one of the things I like about, about Jesse McCullough – is that he's kind of has the ability to stretch the floor with his three point shot, but he's not married to living outside the three point line or just showing off his skill. He's a guy that'll get it done any any old way you need it. Uh, he's got a nice looking jump hook. Uh, he's a tough kid. Um, he, you know, he's not a he's not a guy that he's not a guy that you have to like complete has to dominate the ball uh, to make an impact. And uh, you know, he just. He's starting to grow into his body and his athleticism is starting to take off. He's had a couple 20 point, 20 rebound games this year uh, in some showcase games down there in Ohio. And uh, to me, as someone who's had a lot of respect for, uh, for high school basketball in the state of Ohio, in terms of getting some of that football toughness out there in the basketball court, I think it's, it's a good thing that Michigan state's recruiting him. Um, You know, he's got about 25 offers Um, among those offers, uh, Michigan, Alabama, Ohio state, uh, Wisconsin, uh, so a lot of teams are out there looking at him and, you know, it's like one of those deals where Michigan state's been on him for so long. And, uh, you know, they've made a, a very nice, they've done a very nice job of emphasizing the family structure and the support system at Michigan state. And, you know, we talk a lot when we talk about basketball recruiting in Michigan state about the OKGs, our kind of guys. And Jesse McCulloch to me is an, is an OKG. He's got a family that supports him, but is also, um, you know, is also tough on them as well. And uh, they want, I think they want to be in a program that has the kind of support that Michigan State has, obviously has great basketball. Um, but I think he's a good fit for the Michigan State program. And, and I've always felt like when you bring in a, a really highly re- rated class like Michigan State did in, in uh, you know, in the last recruiting cycle with two McDonald's All-Americans, uh, a NBA prospect in Cohen Carr, and, and then, you know, and then a, gear, a shooting guard like Garrick Norman, that's like a top 10 class, consensus top 10 class. The year after that, I think it's really important to bring in uh, OKGs that have a that have a high ceiling. You know, after Michigan State brought in the Cassius Winston, Miles Bridges class, the year after that, it was, uh, you know, Xavier Tillman and Jaron Jackson. And I'm not sure what size class this is going to be this year. But to me, a guy like, uh, you know, a guy like Jesse McCulloch can fit with a lot of different um, classes. He's got a lot of different He's got a lot of versatility. Um, you know, maybe he's not quite as skilled as Joey Hauser was coming out of, out of high school. I won't, but he is skilled, and he's got a little bit more athleticism, a, a lot more athleticism. He's kind of like, to me, a cross between Malik Hall and, and, you know, and Joey Hauser. All right, and he took an official visit to Alabama in February. Did you get a sense that any more visits are coming up for Jesse McCullough? He, he took an unofficial visit, I believe. To Alabama? I believe, yeah, he yeah he took an unofficial visit, I believe, to Alabama. Um, based on what, maybe maybe I'm wrong, and that maybe I need to go back and and revise my story. But um, no official visits are set coming up. Now there is some talk within the family about how they want to do this. You know, he's got a top eight right now. Uh, Alabama, Michigan State, um, are um, are right up there uh, is is as well as you know Michigan, uh, Indiana. You know, I, I would say they're trying to figure out whether they want to go from a top eight to a top five to a top three. Um, and, uh, and they're, they're not quite sure how they want to proceed with that. 
nothing set up moving forward. I will say this. Uh, he came up with his entire family, mom and dad, and aunts and uncles from uh, Kentucky. So to me, that's a little bit different right there when you've got that many people up there. Uh, senior day thing, that always makes an impact on people that are like family-oriented uh, type prospects and they were very impressed with it with the senior day um and then the other thing as far as timetable you know he says he he want he's open to visiting other people but he's also talking about getting this thing done um you know early on in the spring aau season and you know as well as i do that that starts next month so there's not really a whole lot of time coming up especially when you're in the basketball playoffs this team plays in the uh, you know his team is in the sweet 16 of the ohio division three tournament uh you know the first game is tomorrow night um, you know, of that sweet 16. So and they're spread out a little bit. So you don't really have a lot of time for, for official visits. So I'm not sure, um, you know, I'm not sure what he's got coming up. Um, but I do know that he's been to Michigan State, you know, official visit after taking maybe three or four unofficial visits to Michigan State. So I think things are things are sitting pretty well with, with the Spartans because he's already been identified as a high priority. There's been other guys that have taken official visits, and I'm not sure exactly where Michigan State stands with them, whether they're going to be in, you know, an all-out go um, coming off the spring evaluation period. Jesse McCulloch is a high priority for Michigan State, and uh, it'll be interesting to see if uh, if if um, they wrap him up and when they wrap him up. The, the one interesting thing that his dad uh, said today when I was talking to him is, um, you know, Michigan State really likes the fact that he communicates as well as he does on defense. Um, and that he's right when he communicates on defense. Not only is he willing to talk, but he's making the right reads or making the right decisions and helping his guys get into the right places. And they feel like he can be an anchor for the defense that they can kind of build a defense around. And uh, you don't always hear that. Those are us That's usually a good sign. You don't hear that if a kid has low basketball IQ. You don't hear that if the kid can't move well enough to build a defense, defense around. So I think, all, I think Jesse McCulloch is kind of what uh, maybe Michigan State has been looking for. Um, I, I thought maybe um, they had a chance to get a guy like that uh, with a kid from uh, shoot. I can't remember his name, but the kid that went to to Illinois last year from uh, from Rod Grand Plain Rogers Ty Rogers. Yeah, I'm not saying you know he's not the same kind of player as Rogers, but I thought Rogers was a, was a guy that you could do some things around defensively. He's had a heck of a freshman year. But Michigan State's been in the looking for you know looking for some guys like that in that in that big big body range, versatility and defense. Um, those guys are hard to find. I'm not saying McCulloch is that guy, but you know I think there's a willingness there, and uh, he's a smart dude. An OKG, probably a four year guy. You know you never know with guys that are really are really skilled. But yeah, I think so. The I one, so, yeah. the one, the one thing that the one thing that he, you know, for him to like, for him to get super hype, he's got, you know, one thing he needs to do, uh, maybe a little bit better job of, and his dad's been on him pretty hard about this is, uh, you know, getting better at putting the ball on the floor. Um, but yeah, I, I think he he strikes me as a four four year guy. Um, you just you just never never know. And uh, right. but but Michigan State needs, you know, when I look at when I look at this year. And what they could use, um, you know, I think they're getting in, in Colin Carr, a guy that can rebound the heck out of the ball. But, you know, they need to keep get back to that. I, it's hard to find guys without sacrificing toughness. It's hard to find the guys with the skill you you need for today's game, a, along with the toughness that you need in the, you know, the the rebounding and defensive guys that can win you championships. Because that's, that's what you got to do. All right, I got a little problem with my battery here, Alec, or – Paul, give me about 20 seconds to see if I can switch the cord. There we go. Paul, that's great information, and uh, I'm looking forward to reading that story for sure. No one covers recruiting for basketball recruiting at Michigan State like you do, and you've been doing it for more than 15 years, and I look forward to seeing the insight that you have in that story. It's over at SpartanMag.com. If you're not a subscriber to SpartanMag.com, get over there. Become a Michigan State uh, super fan. Subscribe to SpartanMag.com. Just in time for March Madness and spring football coming up. We'll have coverage of that. 
starting next week as well. But I look forward to that story. Uh, good job, Paul, getting a hold of the McCulloch family. Safe to say Michigan State's the leader in the clubhouse right now for McCulloch? Yeah, I think so. And it's been like that for it's been like that for a while. I don't want to, you know, like you talk to to them and, and they've got their plan on how they want to do everything. You know, I, I hate to be like, oh, it's 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 locked up. And mm -hmm. because, you know, as well as I do with, with re recruiting, things change quickly. But, um, you know, I think they're navigating the process the right the right way. Uh, if if what they're looking at, you know, the things that they're looking at in a program seem to line up with Michigan State. And uh, and I think both the parents and uh, the kid are on the same page. Tom Izzo's uh, absolutely uh, killed it on this recruitment in terms of, you know, there's times where I feel like there's times where it surprises me at how active Tom Izzo is in the recruitment. And sometimes those don't always work out. But then there's other times where the recruitment where he's super active and no one has a chance because uh, he inserts himself into the recruitment so early. Uh, this is one of those deals where, um, you know, he's – He's really made an impact, and uh, and, and I, I feel like there's a little bit of motivation there for him because it's a Midwest guy. Michigan State, you know, I, I think they need to keep on getting Midwest guys, but you also have a bunch of – you also have several Big Ten teams, including your in-state rival, including Ohio State, um, out there looking at looking at, it, at him, getting after it. Um, you know, you've got a little bit of national flair with Alabama out there. Uh, this this is a this is one of those guys that you know I think that Michigan State needs to uh, needs to, to lock up and the, the other thing with with uh, with McCullough I, I feel like Michigan State in last year's class really started to kind of get get a little bit more uh, involved in Ohio again and I'm not sure why exactly that is but I felt like for a long time that Michigan State's been missing out on not having like you know an Ohio kid in every other class like they used to and, and those guys those guys bring a little bit of something extra. <laughs> And for the most part, kids from Ohio um, are tough enough to handle, uh, you know, some of the tough coaching they get. And uh, and I think you you can do a lot worse than getting an Ohio kid uh, from from Cleveland, um, you know, especially one that rebounds. I agree. Good stuff. All right, we got a question here from Ralph E. out of Highland Park, Illinois. He says, "Can you remember when Tom Izzo has so adamantly said that a team of his is good enough to make a run?" And what the outcome was compared to this year. Um, Ralph says, I think there are a lot, including mine, of hopes are being raised. And I'm curious how that worked out in the past, especially one like this that has a pretty average record going into a postseason. Uh, what he's getting to, of course, is Izzo's been saying for the last two or three weeks, don't give up on us. We can make a run. I still think this team can make a run. And now people can probably envision that a little bit more clearly than they maybe would have two or three weeks ago. Um Izzo has said that in the last couple of weeks. Ralph from Highland Park, Illinois, is asking us when is the last time is there a, 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 a have there been seasons where it's been where he's been similarly adamant? I'm not sure he's been adamant about it. And even Izzo said last week, you know, sometimes it never works out. You never get there. Um, but uh, can you think of other seasons when he's been like this, or the season has been like this, or the group of players have been like this? And what the outcome has, has been in March. I've got a, I, I took some notes on this, but I'm interested to see what you would have to say. Yeah, I can think of a few of them, and I, I would say, so usually when this happens, let me let me start with the, what I think is a catalyst for these type of we can make a run type predictions. It's usually a team that has that has the pieces that Izzo thinks that he needs to make a run, but also have taken some stumbles or have uh, you know or have had some issues preventing them from reaching what he would, what he would think is, is their, is their potential. Mm -hmm. Or there's been a couple bad losses, which really there hasn't been this year. There hasn't been, you know, what I would say, you know, bad losses. You, you could argue earlier in the season, well, well, that Northwestern loss, but now that given where Michigan state was at when they lost to Northwestern at home. Um, but, but those are the kind of criteria. So I'll give you, I'll give you, uh, you know, three examples that I, I came up with. <clears throat> Uh, you know, the first one I would say was 2007, 2008. Michigan State made it to the Sweet 16 of the NCAA tournament mm -hmm. as as the fourth place Big Ten team. They ended up with a 27 or 24 and seven record, 12 and six overall. Um, they had a couple bad losses, but that that's you know in Big Ten play. That was a team that had Drew Neitzel as a senior, Kalen Lucas as a freshman, mm -hmm. and you know they lost to Wisconsin in the Big Ten tournament, mm -hmm. I believe. Uh, you know, by two, that was a disappointment. Raymar Morgan was a sophomore that year. And they kind of, I think they came into the big, 
Big Ten. Um, I think they came in the NCAA tournament as maybe a, a was it a six or seven seed. I can't remember. They played Temple. There were five. Uh, it was, no. was a five twelve. I've got it right here. You're right. They yeah, lost to Wisconsin. They lost to Wisconsin by two in the Big Ten tournament, and yeah. that was when Izzo was just pulling his hair out about Bo, Bo Ryan. Right. And, you know, and Michigan State fans. Michigan State fans are at the same time. We're also like, you know, like what was me because you're. The Sweet 16 at that time was, you know, that was bottom of the barrel or, you know, it was final four bust, the Wisconsin thing. Um, you know, so that team, you know, that 12-5 game, that, that was a really good Temple team that they beat in that in that first round. That, that team had DJ Strawberry. And then they played one of the better team, better, better uh, you know, round of 32 games I can remember covering, um, mm-hmm. you know, against number 17 Pitt. That was a great game. Yeah. And there was, there was a little, that was a, Great back and forth game. Pitt was very and good. Pitt, Pitt had won the Big East tournament, a number four seed, strong Pittsburgh team. That yeah, was Jay, had, that was uh, uh, the guy who's coaching at TCU now. I forget his name. Yeah, um, Jamie. Uh, Jamie Dick, Dixon. 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 Yeah, that was the best Pittsburgh team he ever had. Yeah, and he had that. He had that six eight guy inside. Sam. That played. Sam Young. Oh no! The, that the was that was the out, they, was that was the outside guy. I want to say not Dewan Wagner, but they had an inside guy, and then they had and then they had like a you know like then they had a wing that was like a two hundred pound wing that was athletic, and and those those two guys are really good. Michigan State beat those guys beat those guys, and and physical one of, game physical. It was a great game, one of the best games I remember covering. At and altitude, then, at altitude, also that was that was a battle. Yeah, that was out there in Denver. Um, that was amazing. That. As an aside, I hate to go down the down the a tangent here, but that was the time like uh, that was the time where where Notre Dame lost in the and remember the leprechaun got really got really upset. So we're sitting around. I think you were with me, but we we're sitting around uh, watching Notre Dame play, and the leprechaun got so mad at Notre Dame's uh, loss that he he left a whole stack of his uh, his glamour photos <laughs> yeah. on the on, had, on the score on the on the you know the press table. He had publicity handouts, yeah. Yeah, so that's you know, kind of felt that's weak. Yeah, yeah, he was, you know, he he maybe me, you know, maybe I'd be upset too if I didn't bring luck. Uh, and th- that was, you know, there that was a Notre Dame team that was pretty pretty overrated. I felt like, um, you know, they lost to George Ma- or they they beat George Mason in the in the opening round out there, and George Mason couldn't buy a bucket. George Mason, by the, I was impressed that game because they had the best. Pep band I've seen in a long time. Uh, those guys could get it get it going. But Michigan State, after the Sweet 16 team, they ran into uh, John Calipari's uh, Memphis Tigers, number two ranked team in the in the country at that time. That team was loaded with talent, and Michigan State fell behind 50 to 20 at halftime. Uh, they made it an 18 point game, but it was over. That team was un- that team was ridiculous. I-, I thought, you know, that was one of those deals where Izzo said before the NCAA tournament, like, you know, if things are right, we can, we can make a run. I completely agree with him on that because Michigan state had some really good pieces. They just happened to run into the wrong team. I mean, if you run into a team as good and talented as Memphis um, at that, in that sweet 16, you're not, you're not advancing. Um, so that's what happened with that one. That was think, uh, Calipari's zenith with Memphis. They had Derrick Rose. They went to the national championship yep. game against Kansas and really had Kansas beat. There was like a free yeah. th- a free throw situation that got away from them. But basically, Michigan State lost to a national championship caliber team in the Sweet 16. So that was one instance when Izzo, when Izzo was telling us throughout the course of the season or late in the season that the team could make a run. Is that how you remember it? I don't happen to remember it that way, but you remember. Yeah, you I remember. It. Yeah, I remember it that way just because you know having been there at the at the Big Ten tournament. After that loss to Wisconsin, you know, I remember Izzo saying, you know, I like this team. I, we can, you know, if things we've got okay. all every we've got the guys that we need to, you know, to make to make a run. OK, um, you know, the other thing, other one I would say would be. Um, and that, you know, was a, that was a Michigan State team that finished 12 and six in the Big Ten, fourth in the Big Ten. Yeah. Yeah. The, the year before they'd had a couple of tough years, like the year before was Neitzel and nobody else on that team. And they they were eight and eight. They were an eight seed. They played Marquette in the first round and, and gave North Carolina a really tough game. Uh, out there. And then the year before that, in 06, they were 8-8 eight and eight in the Big Ten and lost to George Mason. That was the senior year for Paul Davis and Ager, and, and, and that was uh, an ugly and season. Brown, so, and so, Shane Brown coming out as a junior that year. Yeah, so Michigan State had, had a couple of lean years, and then that year with Neitzel as a senior, um, um, fourth in the Big Ten, but but beating Pittsburgh into the Sweet 16 was, was a nice accomplishment. So that was a run. You get to the second weekend, that's a run. Not as far as Izzo would have liked with a, maybe a different draw um but uh that, that's interesting that you re, that uh you remember it that way and, and you were there after they lost that heartbreaker to wisconsin what was your next one paul 
Well, I think 2009, and I know that I know that I know that like you look at what they did with the record wise, and uh, you know, and it, it doesn't seem like that you know that it was a down team, um, you know, with uh, with with runs. But you look at you know you look at uh, I think they had they had some good pieces in that team, but a, another ugly loss in the Big Ten tournament that had people really down. Uh, if you go back to to that, you know. That year, they had a they had a beat down on the road at Purdue where they lost by 20 points. Uh, I, I don't understand why people think that that's a you know that usually Michigan State loses by 20 points or 15 at, uh, on the road at Purdue. Michigan State it's panic. Mm-hmm. It's just playing on the road at Purdue. But they also had bad losses to Northwestern and Penn State at home during that season. Um, and then they they had uh, Northwestern they had, the, uh, had that, Northwestern had that goofy dude that was shooting from the logo right. Yeah, they, Boyle. The, what was the, the guy's name? The Koble guy or Koble. something like yeah, that. Koble. Yeah, but Kevin you know Koble. that's when Northwestern always had those kind of guys. And Michigan, but State, was, a, Michigan State was fifteen and two at the time. The right. Northwestern people freaked out. So then you know, but also they had the the black eye of, and it shouldn't have been at the time, but they played in that forward field game earlier. Mm-hmm. You know, in the in the season where everyone was like, Michigan State sucks because they lost to the best team in the history of college basketball. You know, like well, in the last twenty years, but they lost to that team that had like five five or six first rounders on it by 20 points, uh, you know, before they were even close to being ready, you know, uh, you know, in the preseason, that was kind of like a, that was kind of a black eye. And I will say uh, also, also that was, um, that was, they, they had a two day prep coming back from, they'd, they'd played in the old spice classic in K- Kissimmee, Florida. Yeah. And then the old on, spice on, classic on, also, Friday, I was going to just they had Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Then they had Monday and Tuesday off after playing three games. Then they get North Carolina. And Roy Williams, to his credit, after the game said, "You know, Michigan State is tired. They just played three games this weekend." And ACC Big Ten Challenge gave them two days rest to play this in a football stadium against us. And it just one, you know, so Michigan State didn't have a shot in that one. But that that's that. Uh, but you try to tell people that they're not hearing it. So right. no matter that Michigan State got out to a fifteen to two record, everybody was talking about that blowout loss to North Carolina at Ford Field on December third. Yeah, and the the other thing about that is you go back to that that uh, the Kissimmee deal in Florida. I mean, the thing that that really had Spartan fans rankled in that is Michigan State losing eighty to sixty two to an unranked Maryland team mm-hmm. prior to that. So so I think so a lot of this stuff is like you know like you look at records and you go look back and you say, oh, this Michigan State was team was really good, but when you take it on the chin in certain non conference games and uh, and the perception for Michigan State fans under those circumstances, there's a lot of negatives to it. And then also like the big 10 tournament, they lost to a, they lost to kind of a, an average Ohio state team, 82 to 70 in the first round of the big 10 tournament. Perfect. That, that year. And and that's, that's one of those deals. Like that's a cat, that's a catalyst for, uh, you know, for panic and, uh, and people jumping off the, off the bandwagon. And I feel like, um, I feel like that was one of those years where Izzo was like, man, if we, if we can do some things, uh, you know, we can make a run. But you remember as well as I do that year, like the big X factor there was like, like a Goran Sutan. You know, he at the end of the year, we, I mean, you and I talked about this several times, like in, in VCAS and whatnot, uh, you know, podcasts about, hey, listen, Gor- the key here is Goran Sutan's got to do some things. And he came on at the end of the year, um, you know, uh, I believe Draymond Green came kind of out of nowhere mm-hmm. uh, towards the end of the year. Travis Walton obviously was a great defensive defensive player there. Kalen Lucas, uh, you know, Kalen Lucas really kind of came on at times right. at, at the end of the year. And and uh, Lucas you know, was, that, Lucas was great against Kansas in the Sweet 16, and Travis Walton was great in the second round against a very very good USC team. USC ran a triangle in two, and and they dared Travis Walton to make shots, and he made them. USC yeah. was very good. Kansas was good. Louisville was good in the regional. And final. Louisville was the, Louisville was the top overall seed. As good as Travis Walton was on offense against uh, against USC that year, Travis Walton was even better on defense against Louisville. He took that personal. All that, you know, like there, we've got this many draft picks. We're playing like within 90 minutes for a hometown. Those guys were showboating and, and arrogant. They extremely thought they were going to walk away with it. Extremely disrespectfully it, it, cocky. I didn't like that Louisville team at all. I was, I, they were bad for college basketball. I didn't like No, those no, guys. it was it was funny too because like those guys were so arrogant. They didn't even bother shooting free throws during, uh, during walkthroughs and stuff like that. And they couldn't make a free throw. Travis Walton, uh, I remember afterwards someone asked him about his defense, you know, uh, about defending, I can't remember the guy he defended, but he ended up being a first-round draft pick. And they asked him, 
how good a defense he played against that guy. And Travis Walton's comment was something to the effect of, uh, I played a lot better better guys than him during Big Ten play. I don't even think he was that good. Mm. You know, so that was that was one that uh, where you saw true leadership uh, in a dog like Travis Walton kind of rally everyone around him and kind of everything kind of fell together during that tournament run. But that was one of those other deals where, where I feel like uh, people weren't giving Michigan State enough credit and Izzo kind of had an inkling of these are the pieces I have. We have the potential to make that run. Um, Even though Michigan State was a top ten team most of the season, but yeah, it, but but it's a perception thing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, so people are like, it's an overrated top ten team, and uh, and then you look at the other one. I the other one I came up with was was two thousand and fifteen. Um, you know, when when they made the the Final Four and uh, and there was some really bad losses during the course of of that year. Um, it took a long time for Bryn Forbes to come around defensively. Uh, M- Michigan State was similar to to this Michigan State team in that well, they weren't quite similar, but they didn't have they didn't. There was a lot of talk all season long about you know can Michigan State get anything going on at center. Um, obviously, Gavin Schilling, he was a freshman that time. Matt Costello was really underrated and really undervalued at that time. Uh, but that was the val- Valentine, Forbes, Trice, and Brandon Dawson team. Uh, that lost to Texas Southern during the non-conference play. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they lost some bad losses in Big Ten play before winning six out of their last eight to finish third in the Big Ten. But you're talking about a team that lost at home to to bad Nebraska team, a bad mm-hmm. Illinois team. Um, Texas Southern. Texas Southern was an example. And then, you know, Michigan State – couldn't get what they needed defensively out of guys like Marvin Clark or Bryn Forbes. Um, and, and they finally got those things at the end of the year. Um, that, that team is another team. They finished 27 and 12 mm-hmm. on the year, um, you know, 12 and six in the big 10 play, but there was a lot of flaws in that team. And a lot of things had to happen right for Michigan state to make a run. And there was little, little signs that they could, but every time they kind of like seem to take a step, um, there was something that that seemed glaringly wrong. I, I think that Tom Izzo was kind of bullish on that team, and I, and I think, um, I mean, that, looking back on that team, you're like, I'm not surprised that they made a run, but at that time it was surprising. But Tom Izzo had, you know, he had a little bit more confidence in that team than most everyone else had. Um, I think he's got more confidence, to be honest with you, in this team than he had in that one. Yeah, and that team ended up 12 and six in the Big Ten. I count one, two, three, four, five, I think six overtime losses in the regular season. Lost to Notre Dame in overtime, Texas Southern in overtime. Lost to Northwestern and Minnesota in overtime at Breslin. Lost to oh, uh, Minnesota and also, oh no, I counted Minnesota twice. And lost to Wisconsin in the Big Ten tournament in overtime. So a lot of overtime losses. Um, it, it, Brent, again, that, was, that, Big was, Ten, that Big Ten tournament loss was that, that one that felt so terrible because Michigan State was up by uh you know 12 points late in that game as um, usual against Wisconsin and they just yeah, come back and it was slop. it was like it was like Michigan State was dominating them in the first half you know play dominated for the first two thirds of that game and then you know Wisconsin went on one of those uh you know those laborious uh, annoying runs that were filled with uh, a whole bunch of block charge type calls and uh you know like you know Wisconsin esque type gamesmanship uh bank threes that kind of stuff and and that was during the excruciating, uh, you know, the, the whole Bo Ryan run. And it seemed like every time Michigan State lost to to Wisconsin, and that was a heck, that was Wisconsin's best, you know, best team of the Bo Ryan era, um, one of them. And, uh, but every time Michigan State lost to Wisconsin, it felt like, uh, you know, it felt like a, a sucker punch. And that Michigan State team ended up being a number seven seed. If I remember right, Izzo was not happy about the number seven seed. Izzo was usually not happy about a lot of things. But I know that Michigan State lost, what, 11 games that year. So I can understand them being a seven seed, but he was not happy about it. And I think Illinois did not make it, but Izzo was grouchy about that. And who did they put him against in the first round? Tom Crean, Georgia. Or was it Georgia? No, it wasn't Tom Crean. Tom Crean yeah, was. What, did he, he coached that Georgia team? Yeah, he coached that Georgia team, I believe. Oh no no no! That was the that was the last that was the second yeah. that was the but that was the defensive dude from Georgia. I can't right, remember that right. guy's name. The but Tom, yeah, the Tom but Crean. The Tom Crean was when we were in Winston. That was two years later when, when Crean was no. It was back in like 08. It was when Neitzel was a junior, 
when they played Marquette and they beat Tom Crean, then they played North Carolina and, and they outplayed them. But but that was a Knight, that, that was, was a good junior year. That was a good Georgia team. And the, the thing that was kind of scary about that Georgia team is they had I think they had did they have Yante Maton? Yeah. The kid from in state that was really really good, and uh, Michigan State you know, went through them pretty easily. But the big thing was beating Virginia in the second round as a number two seed. That was back when exactly. Virginia Virginia was like, "Oh crap, we got to play Izzo." And Travis Trice was hot, and then the Sweet Sixteen they get Buddy healed with Oklahoma and the, and the Carrier Dome, and then that the Louisville game that you were talking about um, earlier. Uh, where was that? Was that a different year? No, no the, the Louisville, the Louisville right. game that was that 09. Louisville game was was it that Louisville game was that yeah they beat Louisville in 09 but this Louisville game was totally different remember this is the yeah different. this is a Louisville team that had uh Montrose you know they had, they had the they had Montrose Harrell and then they also had the dude that was a first round draft pick of the Boston Celtics um you know who was a, I can't remember that guy but he was a guard that was hard to handle and I just the thing that the takeaway I had from that is in the press conference afterwards Rick Pitino threw that team completely under the bus and was basically like I need to recruit a whole new roster yeah, that was I at mean, the Carrier Dome. The other one was at was at uh, Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis, right? Correct. So twice yep. beating. So both both those times you're talking about, they end up beating Louisville uh, to go to the Final Four. I got a couple of them also. Uh, I'm re- I'm thinking more along the lines of, um, you know, some frustrating losses. And today, by the way, Goran Sutan was at practice today. He showed up. He was there. He's kind of shooting around afterwards. Had his necklace on. Just hanging out. He's in town. I don't know. Uh, and that that year in '09, he was MVP of the Midwest Regional, which to me is about uh, that's about as strong of an accolade as you can have. If someone asked me if you could, you know, you got to recruit right now, and you have a choice, he can either become first team All Big Ten or MVP of a regional, and then say tournament. I'm taking the MVP of the regional because that means you're in the Final Four. You know what I mean? MVP of a regional is huge, huge accolade so yeah especially especially when you think back to who was in that regional i think that michigan state went through about 12 first round draft picks on the way there you know like I mean, there was like three nba guys on that on the usc team several nba guys on the louisville team several nba guys on the on the uconn team uh yeah i would definitely take uh, i would definitely take uh any kind of accolades in the in the ncaa tournament over over all big 10 because uh you know i was just looking at those all big 10 teams today and i'm like yeah there's some good players in there uh but you know like a guy like joey hauser as good as he was this year you know just an honorable mention I, I i don't know about that and uh you know like also the the all defensive team today you know i know there's some good defensive players on there but you know michigan state's got some good defensive players as well all right we're, we're answering a, answering a question here from ralph e from highland park illinois if you're just joining right. us he says can you remember when izzo so adamantly said that a team is good enough to make a run during the course of the season he's asking us to go back and think about some of those years and and what ended up happening those years i remember 2020 now this is cassius winston's senior year ended up being the COVID year but his brother of course tragically lost his life earlier in the year took his own life and that just devastated cassius of course cassius was in the best shape of his career i mean there, there was a picture of him in the in the locker room. You know, in the locker room, they've got pictures of themselves in the locker stall, publicity pictures that they usually take, like in September or whatever. And the picture goes up, and he and I remember him like you know when we interview these players, they've played a basketball game, they've got their shirt off and stuff. I remember looking at him once. I'm like, man, he's got he's he's chiseled himself. Cassius Winston was never chiseled. Yeah. He was chiseled early that season for his senior year. You know, he was a guy that always ate a lot of Skittles and you know drank pop and all that stuff. Cut that stuff out, got himself in great shape. Then he had that family tragedy, and it was it was obvi- understandably very hard on him all year. And he put a lot of that weight back on. And by the end of the year, he was very good. But they went through some tough times, understandably so. That team they ended up winning the Big Ten, but they were fourteen and six to win the Big Ten, twenty two and nine. At one point, they lost three straight games at Wisconsin, lost to Penn State, lost at Michigan. And, and during that streak, they also lost four out of five. You might remember that Paul Winston senior year, and they had lost four out of five. And I'm not, I can't really remember whether or not, you know, Izzo said that, uh, you know, we're going to be good. It's going to all straighten out. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if he really knew, but they ended up, uh, you know, having that big senior day against Michigan and Winston had a big day and everything looked so great. But then, you know, five days later, the, the world shuts down. So that season never really had a finish. I suspect they would have been really good. You know, Xavier Tillman was a grown man and great leadership on that team between those two. I, I 
you know, that was that was the year that, that, that we'll never know. It was a stolen year. It was the lost year for Michigan State basketball. Um, might that have been Izzo's second national championship, Paul? I mean, they had everything lined up, but there's a lot of other teams where I feel like, you, you know, like that, like the elite eight year that they lost to UConn with Keith Appling with a bro- with a wrist injury. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I honestly feel like if he hadn't had the wrist injury, he was so good early in the year. You know, that game that he had against, I believe it was Kentucky. Um, you know, in the in the Champions Classic, but you, that team I think had everything they needed for a national championship. I, I firmly believe if they played UConn in the first round, or that or they played UConn in the Sweet 16 round. Yeah. And then played Virginia, um, that would have been a different outcome. I, I felt like Virginia took so much out of Michigan State in that game. It was such a physical, emotional game, and then to come back and play UConn, uh, you know, two days later, I think that hurt Michigan State. I felt like that team was good enough to win. There's been other teams like that, but the one that you're talking about, the COVID year, uh, I don't think there's a team in college basketball that year that that I felt like was better than Michigan State. Yeah, and it and. It's- so much regret in a lot of ways that year that that was that's a tough one that that you know could, could have been is you know, Izzo's won one national title I mean he he's been close to some others you know that team that lost North Carolina Michigan State was very good that year but North Carolina was the best team in a 10-year period in college basketball um the year when Kalen Lucas was injured and they go to the final four and they lose to Butler by a point or two down in Indianapolis and Butler loses to Duke by a point or two I mean if if Kalen Lucas is playing I, I I'm sure I very good chance Izzo has two national championships. Very good chance. So, and you mentioned the Appling one. They're playing UConn in Madison Square Garden, and that is considered the second home for UConn basketball. Big, big East tournaments over the years and those type of things. Izzo was very aggravated about that game against UConn. UConn ended up, ends up winning the national championship. Um, Izzo was very ag- aggravated because a big part of their preparation, he's very good on one-day preps in the NCAA tournament, always has been, and he us- utilizes every second, every minute, every meal time, every meeting time. They're getting something done. They're learning another thing, and they don't max out the players with too much information. They might have like a nine-minute meeting before lunch and a seven-minute meeting after lunch, and it might be about how we're going to defend this ball screen against this player and this shooter, and they're just going to go over that for nine minutes, and then they eat, and then seven minutes they're going to talk about this inbound play that the opponent runs. He's got it down to a science. That's why he's so good on a one-day prep. In New York, it drove them nuts. By the time they got there, the hotel was so small because it's New York. Everything's cramped. Usually they go in and do walkthroughs in a hotel ballroom. They don't need rims. They just put tape a key, a top of the key, and a three-point line, and they do walkthroughs in a ballroom on carpet and get the concepts down. Did not have that available to them, and Izzo was pissed. Secondly, going from the hotel to, to Madison Square Garden, getting a bus, took them an hour. They're, on, they're, they're wasting Izzo's time in a damn bus, and Izzo was, hey, to use strong language, pissed. And he always felt that cost them a couple of buckets which cost him another trip to the national to the final four and maybe a national championship. We love Madison Square Garden. Izzo did not like that. And Madison Square Garden is a regional this year. And I had that in the back of my head. If they if they're in a bracket where they end up getting to the second weekend and they're in New York City, it'll be interesting to see what kind of changes Izzo makes um, or is able to make. There's there's not a lot you can do in New York, but you can at least be prepared for it. I don't know. Do they? I don't know what they'll do. If they I, I promise you, they get a hotel. They're going to get a hotel with a with a conference room that they can they can they can tape up and probably I mean, something that, that, where that's walkable distance to the Madison Square Garden, so they don't have to worry about a bus. You might you might walk to the to the, to the thing. There'll be some sort of adjustment. And, you know, I guarantee I've never asked Izzo about it, but, you know, Michigan State has played in the Champions Classic in New York, you know, I don't know, five or six times since then, maybe three or four times. And they played Rutgers at Madison Square Garden this year. They've played there a few times. And I'll bet Izzo has been scoping it out every time in case that ever happens again. But Izzo has been close to having a couple of others. All right, I'll talk about another one. You know, the, the, uh, in 2015, um, the well, we, we already talked about that. That was the year they went to the Final Four and uh, beat Louisville in the Carrier Dome. All right, one other one, my last one. 2010, it was the year uh, that, they, that they went to um, uh, that uh, Kalen Lucas was injured. And, you know, Kalen Lucas was Big Ten Player of the Year as a sophomore. And then as a junior, has a knee injury or something, an ankle injury, something like that. And he's injured at midseason. And they lost three straight games. This is the year after they had gone to the national championship game against North Carolina at Ford Field. They beat UConn in the Final Four. 
this is the year 2010, they go back to the Final Four and ultimately lose to Butler in the Final Four. But during the course of that season, they lost three straight that year at Wisconsin, at Illinois, and Purdue at home. And then they were one and done in the Big Ten tournament, Paul. And you were there. That's when Izzo benched Darrell Summers and his teammates were yelling at him. What do you remember about that one? Oh, yeah. I remember that that, uh, was that Travis Walton, he was a senior that year. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember him. Like no, I remember no, no, I, what's Walton? Walton was a senior in 09. It would okay. have been Delvon Rowe, maybe, or Draymond Green. Draymond, yeah, it was Draymond Green was there. I just remember I, I remember upperclassmen. I just remember upperclassmen. Uh it, yeah, it was it was Draymond, I believe it was, that was was chirping at was Mark Montgomery was still an assistant coach there, right? Probably, at that time. Probably, yeah. I believe it was either it was Draymond either chirping at Mark Montgomery or chirping at Dwayne Stevens about you know screaming at him to to bench Darrell's butt, and uh, because he was playing such horrible defense. That was I, that's the only time that I can remember players on the Michigan State bench, um, you know, just adamantly telling coaches to pull someone out of a game, and then also chirping at a guy, chirping at a guy when he was on the end of the bench for being such a punk. And uh, it, I've never seen it. I've never seen it happen after that. But I do believe I've all, always felt that that was like a galvanizing moment for, you know, for that team. Because, I mean, that was like one of those deals where players take ownership of it. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, you know, like sometimes that can be pretty destructive. D- Darrell Summers was never a dude that I felt like had any kind of leadership capability or whatever. I felt like that he had the ability to kind of go into a funk at times that mm-hmm. team was not a great with the exception of of Draymond that team was not a great leadership they did not have a lot of great player leadership on, on that team but I do feel like that was like you know that was one of those things where where a guy took took uh you know took control of the, to the game and he's like this is not Michigan State we don't play that way I don't care who's in there as long as that punk's not in there and and I do think that that I do think that that had some salience to it and I think that that even though Michigan State lost and it was an embarrassing fashion, I, I think that that um, you know that kind of like ownership aspect. I, I think that carried over to the to the run. Was that the year when um, was that Mike Keebler that was? Yeah, that I mean he had to play because Kalen Lucas was injured in the second round in the in the closing minutes against Maryland or halfway through the Maryland game. I mean Austin Thornton was playing and Keebler had to come in and play defense, a walk on. And they they had to tape it together, and they they beat Maryland. Uh, Corey Lucius with the the buzzer beater to win that game in Spokane. And, and, Kansas, and that was a real that was a great Maryland team with with uh, with Grievous Vasquez, mm-hmm. and they had a, a good big man, and they were pretty good in transition. And uh, that you know like that is one of the best Maryland team. You know that if you went back if you went back and we were talking when we were Maryland dudes talking about chances that that you know teams that they thought had a chance to win. And that they didn't. That would be one of the ones that they would they would point to because Maryland had a very good big man. They had good guards. They had one of the best guards in the country in Grievous Vasquez, and uh, you know Michigan State pulled that one off at the buzzer. So Michigan State it took on a lot of losses because Corey Lucius or because Kalen Lucas was hurt, and they ended up. Uh, what, what's the record end up here? I've got it here somewhere. Let me see. But they ended up 28 and 9. I mean at the end of the regular season they must have been like 24 and 8 or something like that. 14 and 4 in the Big 10. And that team Izzo thought had a chance if Kalen Lucas could come back, if he could come back from his mid-season injury. You know, the trouble with Darrell Summers trying to get him to play defense all year. They lose that game one and done in the quarterfinals against Minnesota. So people are giving up this team for dead, right? And he benched Summers to make a point to him. But then Summers came back, and Michigan State in that game against Maryland, like early second half, maybe late first half, Darrell Summers was nailing three-pointers in transition. And it was one of those, you know, Izzo got through to him, now Darrell Summers is really playing well, at least on offense. And it was looking like one of those storybook things. Benched him in Chicago, almost took the loss on purpose to make a point. One week later, he's drilling them against a very good Maryland team. By the way, Michigan State was a five seed, and everybody knows five twelve seed is dangerous. Twelve seed was New Mexico State; they're pretty good. You know, New Mexico State scored a couple shots late, but you know, to pull it close, ended up being seventy to sixty-seven. Difficult one in the first round, but that Maryland game, Michigan State was rolling. They're playing their best basketball of the season against Maryland, and then Kalen Lucas gets hurt. Snaps his Achilles, looked behind him. He thought somebody hit him with a board or something. They say that's what it feels like when you snap your Achilles. So they have to survive Maryland's furious comeback. On the other side of the bracket, Kansas had been upset by Northern Iowa. So in the Sweet 16, Michigan State got a little bit of a break. And that's what it takes to open up 
a uh, a bracket for you. And Michigan State was a five seed. And I remember, uh, you know, that that day we were in Spokane. You know, it was 2010. The internet was not as competitive back then. And I went skiing that day up at Mount Washington. And I remember hearing, I saw like the end of it when Kansas lost. And I remember thinking, man, that opens up the bracket. Now, Michigan State was a number five seed. It lost a lot of games. And, you know, and, and this was before the Maryland game. So, Kalen Lucas wasn't hurt yet. So, Michigan State had won one game. And that Kansas result, I'm like, this team could, it, this team could go to the Final Four. And they did, but they did it without Kalen Lucas. They beat Northern Ireland in the Sweet 16 at St. Louis. And then Tennessee, a, a war against Tennessee. Raymar Morgan came out of that game with a chipped tooth. Had a big free throw at the end, 70-69. to 69, Draymond Green... So that was a game, a team that ended up being a five seed, lost a lot of games, a lot of internal turmoil with trying to get Darrell Summers ironed out, the injury to Kalen Lucas, uh, Draymond Green as a sophomore wanting to be the leader, but there were some, you know, there were some guys on the team that were older than him that maybe didn't have the greatest habits, and he just kind of had to, had to, you know, roll with it the best he could. Was that the year when Draymond Green was getting on Derek Nix's back, and Derek Nix gave him a black eye, knocked him down. And Izzo, that was, or was that the no, next I year? No, I think that was the next year. That because that was like, uh, I believe that was that was the. Wait, wait, no, no, that must have been like was I can't remember. Was that two thousand nine when Nix was a? Was well, a, well if no, you, no, it, no, 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 it wasn't. If you, if you don't know, you don't know. <laughs> One of those years that might have been the year, but Nix, you know. Uh, hit Draymond Green, knocked him down. Izzo kicked Knicks out of practice, and 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 uh, Draymond Green said no, no, no. He went out in the hallway and brought him back into practice. In other words, Draymond Green's like, I yeah. don't care. He knocked me down. He should have, but we got work to do. So there was. It was one of those years that <laughs> happens every year where Michigan State has so much work to do, so much turmoil. You know, get things ironed out. People quitting on him a little bit. And Izzo saying this team has something if we can just get this, this, and this. So. This team doesn't have as much physicality as some of those teams, and they get along a lot better than some of those teams. Hey, so but, I'm, uh, but I'll go back to that that team. You know that 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 team that the 2010 team also had Chris Allen who completely fogged yeah, up. Yeah. So we can say that they don't have the physicality. I would say right now, I would say absolutely unequivocally that Michigan State guards better at the at the guard position and has better. You know, they've got better people. Um, you know, all across the board that Michigan State had and and on that, that team. These guys are together, man. That that was a train wreck. I mean, in terms of uh, conflicting personalities and uh, you might have had a couple of leadership guys that can pose their, pose their will, but, uh, you know, in the in the yeah, grand and, and, scheme of things, that was not, you know, if, if Michigan State doesn't have uh, like a Raymar Morgan or doesn't have, uh, you know, a Draymond Green, that thing is, that thing is falling off the tracks. And these guys are, these guys on this team are good human beings. Mm-hmm. And and I feel like I feel like they've also got, you know, the the lasting thing for I remember from that Indianapolis Final Four is it's just like man if they just had one more player that wasn't a knucklehead if they had one guard that wasn't a knucklehead uh, one more when, guy when they, they lost when they lost to Butler yeah when they lost to but, Butler because if you know had, Chris if Allen had, if they had Kalen Lucas <laughs> if they had Kalen Lucas but you know like Chris Allen disappears yeah. the night before that game yeah uh, you know there's so many so many wacko thing wacky things going on these guys you these guys to me like. I, Again, it comes down to matchups. We don't know who that Northern Iowa is going to be, and that Northern Iowa team that they played was a good team too. Good, it was just, good. it was just uh, the thing that would have hurt them is if it was an up tempo, like really fast, phys- or fast like athletic team. Northern Iowa, they could Michigan State could play could play slow. Um, you know, to me, the, this Michigan State team, they they've got a lot of different pieces. I don't know what the matchups are going to be like. And then, you you know, you talk about and you look at it and you look at, OK, well, what about records? You're talking about teams that you thought were kind of garbage Michigan State teams or ones that were barely holding on and they only had seven losses or eight losses or nine losses. And I'd be, you know, I'm saying right now is college basketball has changed a whole lot in right now because of all the transfer rules in portal rules. Um, there are going to be a lot more close losses. And you look around college basketball. And I, I swear to you, Jim, I'm looking at the rankings and anybody that's got got to 20 wins in any conference, I feel like all of a sudden is in the top 25 now. Yeah. It's, and, it's, uh, uh, and, and it's not indicative of who is good or who, who has the best pieces. I just feel like, um, you know, people that are putting polls out there are throwing darts at the board. Mm-hmm. As soon as Maryland, as soon as Maryland got to 20 wins, boom, they're already up to 17 or whatever. 
Mm -hmm. And they're good on a given day. They've not done anything on the road. There's a lot of teams like that across the country. There's a lot of teams with holes in them. And it could be like last year when North Carolina was on the bubble one week and they go all the way to the Final Four three weeks later. That that could happen with Kentucky this year. That could happen with Michigan State this year. Someone could come out of nowhere. You know, Miami of Florida has a great coach. Larry Nega is great. So, uh, you know, they've been good when they lead eight last year, right? Um, also, what was the, remember there was one year um, when Draymond Green as a younger player, either a freshman or sophomore, so it was either the 09 team that went to Ford Field Final Four or 2010 that went to Indianapolis and lost to Butler. One of those two years, remember they had that sleepover at Breslin? Um, Draymond Green, like, you know, had the idea, you know, in high school one time we all slept in the gym. You know, what if we did something like that? And the players were like, yeah, okay, let's do that. Because the team didn't get along that great. But the point is – they there were some losses in there too, and Izzo was like, "Okay, let's have a sleepover." So I don't know if you remember that story, but they were they had sleeping yeah. bags and slept at center court at the gym or here and there, and trainers and everybody. They were all I don't know. Izzo said they got something out of it. It was Draymond's idea. The point is, is that there was enough enough problems going on that Izzo that Draymond Green suggested that, and they did it, and they ended up going to a Final Four. But that was one of those years I can't remember specifically if Izzo Izzo always says we got a chance to make a run. Once in a while, he does not. In 2011, after this year, you know, that, that, that Butler year, the next year when Draymond Green was a junior, by that time, Chris Allen had been cast off. By that time, Corey Lucius only made it halfway through the year, and they got rid of him. And, you know, still had Darrell Summers and, and Delvon Rowe, and, it just, and that, that year they lost a bunch of games and lost to UCLA in the first round. And then they got rid of those guys. Draymond took it over the next year as a senior, and they were really the surprise, one of the surprise teams in the country. But specifically, there's a good question that he asked. So it's interesting to go down memory lane and try to remember some of these times. And might this be one of those years where Izzo says, we're gonna make, we can make a run, we can make a run, and they do. Right now, I, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen this weekend. We don't know what the bracket's going to be. But Michigan State looks to me like they've got as good a chance to be a Sweet 16 team as just about anybody in the country except for maybe a handful in the top 10. Otherwise, it's wide open, and why not Michigan State? Yeah, and I would I would say the the other thing that I like about this, you know, I was in the same boat as a lot of Michigan State fans out there, and I'm like, hey, it's really unfair that Michigan State didn't play Minnesota, you know, because they would have, you know, they would have needed everyone to win on on Sunday, uh, you know, to be to be in the top four. But the way that played out, mm-hmm. you, you know, I think it worked out really well for Michigan State. Um, you know, obviously having a little bit of extra practice time, one extra day of practice, mm-hmm. um, you know, not having to go, not having to go to, uh, to Chicago and play four games in four days. You know, I, it's, I think it's pretty sure. telling that Mich- Michigan state's won more big 10 tournaments than any other school in the, in the, in the big 10, but they've never won the big 10 tournament going for four day, you know, four games in four days. Iowa has, I think they were one of the, maybe Michigan has, they're maybe the only two, but you don't want that going into, you know, going into the NCAA tournament, especially if you're going to, if you're going to have to play uh, somewhere on Thursday, uh, this Michigan state team, the way that they were able to get that, get that double by without having to reschedule the Minnesota game. Um, it's, it's, it's disappointing that they didn't, you know, if they win that, then they're tied for second in the, in the big tents, so I guess. So what now, mm-hmm. but it, it, this works out really well for, for a guy like, you know, especially when you're focused on getting back to uh, some of the basics like defense and rebounding. Um, I, I think just having an extra day going into Chicago fresh. Um, if Michigan state gets through that first, first game, um, I wouldn't be surprised to see them win a big, big 10 tournament championship. I'd really like to see that for these guys, because I think they have such a good group of guys and I think they would deserve to, uh, you know, everything that you've gone through. It'd be nice to see them hang, uh, you know, a big 10 tournament banner. And guess what? After that, everyone will be talking about them as an NCAA tournament dark horse. Yep. When you go back and we look at all these things that we just talked about, mm-hmm. just a minute for the last half hour, uh, 45 minutes, a lot of these things where people are saying you've got no chance to make an NCAA tournament run were the byproduct of Michigan State not winning a Big Ten cha- tournament championship, where mm-hmm. everyone's like, oh, you're garbage. You didn't win that and you should have beat this team, blah, blah, blah. But, um, you know, sometimes that's a catalyst. You know, I think, I think this team though I think this team has learned the lessons that a lot of teams need to learn about close losses. Um, and when I was watching big, when I was watching basketball on Sunday, when I've been watching it, this, you know, some of the championship games in the smaller conferences, I tell you what, every single game I watch, there's a missed cutout that costs the team a chance to make, to advance. And those are the kind of things, missed cutouts, rebounds, shot selection, uh, you know, jump stops, uh, shot fakes, the little tiny things that you're supposed to be taught, um, you know, throughout your basketball career that, 
those are the things that win you games, give you a chance to move on. And it's surprising. It's not surprising to me because I see it every year, but it just reinforces that when I watch someone else play basketball, that, you know, little things like cutouts, they truly matter. And Izzo made that point after the Iowa game. There's enough stuff in the last two minutes of guys fogging out, making little mistakes. He showed it to them when it went over just those two minutes. He didn't look at the rest of the film. He said, either this gets through to your to you guys or I'm wasting my time here. We're all wasting our time here. And he knew that that would resonate with these guys. They got good hearts and good minds. They know what they need to do. I talked to Hauser about it today in Malik Hall. They, you know, I asked them you know, when they look back at the, the defensive things, they need to shore up um, because the field goal percentage defense has suffered in the last couple of weeks. They know what they need to do, and it's about getting locked in and getting it done. They've done it before. It's not like new guys are having to, like Deontay Davis is having to learn it for the first time. Um, they feel confident they'll get that part of it squared away. I got one more question here. Big Don uh, had a question about uh, the incoming basketball recruiting class for next year and how they fit in. You know, Xavier Booker uh, ranked, um, you know, top 10 by most people. The industry ranking is number eight. Jeremy Fears, number 29 for the on three industry ranking. Cohen Carr, number 42. He's really skyrocketed up six, seven, 200, maybe the most athletic guy in the recruiting class. Derek Norman, number 67 in the industry ranking, uh, you know, six, six shooter from Texas. Those four guys, uh, how do you see them fitting in? Jeremy Fears has all kinds of leadership. Uh, you know, if, Tyson Walker comes back. You got Hogard. You got Holloman. You got Fears. How do they all fit in with Fears with the backcourt if, if Walker comes back? Yeah, that, that's I've been thinking about the whole Fears thing, how he would fit in, and I'm not I'm not really sure. I, I just know that one of the things that I do know that like all those guys, like even Hogard, the like Fears, the one thing that he doesn't really have, you know, and I know people see the mixtapes and they see like a step back three here or there. And you could do the same thing if you went back and look at AJ Hogard's mix mixtapes. Jeremy Fears, I, th- I think, uh, you know, for him to be really consistent or for him to have like a regular role, uh, he's got to get a little, I mean, he's got to continue to work on his shot. I know he's put in a lot of time on that. Uh, but the same thing with Trey Holloman. Um, you know, I look at those two and I think, if, if Trey Holloman doesn't get better at his shooting, um, you know, like, but then, you know, does Jeremy Fears defend as, as, as much as well as Trey Holloman's? So it's going to be really interesting. There's going to be a lot of competition at the point guard position. And uh, I'm not sure where to see Jeremy Fears if, if a Tyson Walker's coming back. I do know this, though, even if, like, let's say Tyson Walker leaves. Then you're looking at Michigan State and you're saying, oh, okay, someone has got to someone has got to take on a, a bigger scoring role, and somebody has to get better at shooting. And you know, I would say all three of those guys. Uh, Garrick Norman is interesting to me. I've talked to his like his high school coach and also his trainer, and they have a lot of familiarity with Matt McQuaid when he was coming out of Duncanville. Um, you know, like uh, Garrick Norman's in the same same area. Now, Garrick Norman's people have told me that that. Norman is more athletic than McQuaid, which, you know, I, no. I take with a grain of salt because I think Matt McQuaid is very underrated oh, as yeah. an athlete. Yeah. You know, he could jump out of the gym. Now, now they say, well, you know, McQuaid wasn't as fluid as Garrick Norman, you know, and that kind of remains to, to be seen. You know, I don't see Garrick Norman as like a elite athlete. No. At the same time, he's coming up at the same time. I think he has a chance to be underrated uh, because of the, because of the um, NY two LA circuit that he's coming out of. You know, I think, the the Dallas, the program that he was coming out of on the N two Y L A circuit is one of the best coached teams on that circuit. They run a lot of college stuff, and and I think that he, I think that he might be better situated than some guys coming out of Texas, um, you know that from like less well coached AAU teams to make that you know to make that thing make the switch. I want to say that you know like I I wonder if I wonder if Norman could play like an undersized four type role. You know, we we talked about that the other other day. Like, okay, like what happens if what happens if if Michigan State plays like a four a team with four guards this year? You know, like what if they play some, like some really undersized guards, like penetrating guys? You know, I think Garrett Norman could fill that role. I'm not sure what his athletic ceiling is like. Uh, you know, I, I know with a guy like Cohen Carr, mm-hmm. he's too athletic to keep off the floor, yeah. uh, and, and he's nasty. Mm-hmm. He wants to play defense. He's tough as nails, and you, I don't care you know, what the skill level is. I don't care, you know, like 
you don't keep guys off, off the floor. It might take him a little while to get there, but Michigan State needs that rebound. He needs that athleticism. Izzo's I think gonna he love get him. Up. Izzo's gonna yeah, love he, him. Yeah, he's a he's a, he is an OKG. Okay I'm surprised you know? that I mean Michigan State kind of got in on him late a little bit, right? I, what was what was the rest of the nation doing with that guy? Why were they sleeping on him? Yeah, I don't know. That's a, that's a good question because it's not like he was a. It was not like he. I mean, he he played for an EYBL team. Usually, those guys are. The only thing I the only thing I can tell you right now is I think people I think I think recruiting analysts I think basketball programs they put such a heavy emphasis on skill and the three point shot and you know like all these things like oh you need to do this like that you know to be this guy in the NBA as sometimes we forget about you know athleticism and I think of a I think of a guy like Colin Carr like all of those dudes uh, you know those those kind of killer types that that Baylor's had. Uh, you know, since yeah. Scott Drew has been there, you know, those, those guys that are ranked in the, in the 50 to 105 range that maybe aren't quite as skilled, but man, they've got, they can jump out of the gym. They're willing rebounders are tough as nails. And, and guess what? You know, I, I thought Michigan State missed out on a huge chance to get a guy like Jer- Jeremy Sochan yeah. uh, in the last class. Uh, he wanted to come to Michigan State. At least he did when I talked to him. Like, uh, you know, he was over in uh, in England and I talked to him over, you know, like uh, when Michigan State was recruiting him. And a lot of people were like, well, he's just not quite skilled enough. He was ranked uh, about 100 at that time. But he tore it up in, uh, you know, like in some of the in, – in like the FIBA International Tournament. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think there's been like – I think there's been like a, a huge – overemphasis on skill and we rank guys so highly like if you're six foot ten six foot nine and you have and you can and you can put the ball on the floor and you can shoot a three-pointer uh you know and you can dribble it from baseline to baseline without dribbling off your foot all, all of a sudden you're not you know you're top 50 you're going to be this guy you're going to be that guy you're going to be kevin durant and uh and i think that's i think there's been an overcorrection in the on the skill side. And I think it's been a, I think it's one of the reasons why, I think it's one of the reasons why year after year, a lot of these, what you consider blue blood programs are rating other programs around the country for, uh, you know, for those guys in the six, eight, six, nine, six, ten range. Uh, you know, they're taking, you know, like Duke and North Carolina have taken a lot of guys out of the big 10 that I, were, I was like, are, you really like him that much? He's that good. You know? And, and uh, because a lot of the guys that are coming out, a lot of guys that are ranked in the top 25, top, top 30 are, are, are skilled, but you know, like we talked about the other night, maybe they're not, maybe they're not on court skilled. Maybe they're practice gym skilled and they don't have the best, they don't have the basketball, not necessarily IQ, but the court awareness. And uh, I think there's, I think that, you know, Michigan state's going to do well to get somewhere in the medium area where they get those guys that are super athletic, like they got early in the Izzo era, but they, also have some skill and some some potential to grow. Yeah, Cohen Carr is going to be an interesting one. Uh, and by the way, Jeremy Sohan ended up at Baylor, impact player there. Xavier yeah, Booker, first round draft, first round draft pick. Xavier, Xavier Booker, top ten player. Uh, we've talked about him. We've been, you know, we we've critiqued his game a little bit and it's freaked some people out. Um, excellent shooting ability and ball handling ability. Runs well, leaps well. All that in a six eleven package with good reach. Those are excellent, excellent tools. Uh, needs to play harder, needs to not play soft, um, has a lot to learn, and I think he has a, a, an, an attitude that should allow him to learn as long as people give him time and space and let him learn, including fans and all the cooks in the kitchen or whatever's going on. You know, as high as he's ranked, you know, he was ranked up there previously like a Paulo Banquero or something like that. He's not going to be coming in and having an immediate you know, splash like a Zion Williamson. If that's what you're expecting, that's not going to happen. He's got a lot to learn. And Paul and I talked about this on the VCast the other night. It would do well for Booker, I think, if Malik Hall comes back and, you know, he's got the temperament to, to tutor him, bring him along, take some of that pressure off of him. Because if Booker starts as a power forward, he's going to get undressed a couple of times. But that length at 6'11", and the shooting ability, and the ball handling ability, the athletic ability, um, Rare tools, but a lot of screws that need to be tightened up, and they got a lot of work to do. But Xavier Booker, your thoughts on him before I let you go, Paul? Yeah, I think the thing that he really needs to do, that he really needs to get better at, is rebounding. Uh, that that that's one area. And then for all the athleticism, you know, the thing that kind of bothers me when I mm-hmm. when I see him play is that there's not more stuff run for him at the rim. You know, like he's got all that athletic ability, uh, you know. But I would like to see, 
you know, whether it was his AU team or whether it's a high school team, I'd like to see more, you know, more lob, lob dunks. And you see them running stuff for six, five guys. Uh, and then also, also as good as his ball handling is, it's like the awareness of when you should put the ball on the floor and you've got to be aware of everyone else around you because, you know, I think uh, just because you have the ability to dribble doesn't mean you should. And uh, it's, for me, it's just, it's for me, he's, he's a guy that's been raw. He's raw. He's got all these, all these tools and he's got a lot of upside, he just needs to play basketball and he needs someone to teach him and he needs to be willing to, to learn. And it's a tough situation. I think that he would want to be going into a program and he'd want to start. And, and I think he probably thinks that he's going to come in and he's going to be a guy that kind of, uh, you know, plays a role like Jaron Jackson played with, with, he was a freshman. I don't think he's ready to play that type of role for Michigan state. And I think it, I think he'll get, get there if, you know, if he has realistic expectations and, and he and he has and he has older player like Malik Call to take take him along and and show him the ropes. I think that's time, the beauty. Time, time, and work and patience. That's on the beauty everybody's of a, behalf. Everybody. The one thing that I've always you know I've always really found you know great about the Michigan State program is for the most part when you have highly regarded young guys, there's usually veteran pro players in the program that are willing to take them along and not only willing but have the desire to do that because someone was there to do that for them. When, when we talk about Michigan state as a, as a culture, Tom Izzo has stressed over and over again, the family aspect of the, of the program. That's not just former players coming back. That's current players bringing young guys along. Even if those young guys are there to take their playing time, that's part of the deal at Michigan state. And, and I, I think I can't think of a better person than a, a Malik Hall yeah. to show Xavier Booker the ropes because he is going to have with those expectations. You know, you see stuff when when people start staying stuff like he's the highest ranked player to you know to sign with with Michigan State or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's just there's such huge expectations. You remember like uh, you know even like a guy like Max Christie. I thought he was ready for that when he came in. When people are being like, oh, he's the highest ranked player since Shannon Brown out of Chicago to sign with with Michigan State. I thought Christie would be able to handle it. There was so much pressure on him. I don't think he handled it well. Mm -hmm. Um, I and, agree. and I, and I hope the same, I hope that, that Xavier Booker is not in a similar situation. Yeah. Fans need to give him time. And if he has time and space and patience and works, it could work out, but give him some space, give him some time. He's got <clears throat> great tools. Garrick Norman, um, as, as an athlete, he leaps well, but I'm not sure about the lateral movement. <laughs> So, I will some, say some the, leaper, you know, not every leaper has great lateral movement. Yeah, I, I would say the one thing that I think I, one one thing that I think would be, maybe be a, a good a reference for him. I can see him developing, maybe in the mold of what a Kyle Arns was, maybe before his all the injuries that he had. Yeah, I mean that one, one, that, yeah. that that to me would be the <laughs> ideal. That would be the ideal for uh, for Garrick Norman. Now, he can really jump out of the gym, and that you know that that's that's a good thing. I, I know he's worked a lot on his agility. And I know he's got a high basketball IQ, and like I said, they run really good stuff. They run. A, he's got a former college coach for, uh, you know, for for I think his AAU coach. And when I was at NY two LA in the summer, that's the first time I've covered, um, you know, like an NY the the NY two LA championship. And you know how like there's always a couple teams that stand out, and you're like, man, they run stuff better than everyone else. That program was was spot on. Um, you know, he was dunking the ball left and right, but. You never know until he gets to the next level. Level uh, what the what the lateral ability is going to be like. If he can be like Kyle Arns pre-injury, that'll be a big bonus for Michigan State because he's going to be a heck of a player for four years. I lied. One more question: Nick Marsh decommitted today. Wide receiver River Rouge in thirty seconds or less. If you want your thoughts on that, I mean, it, it sucks for Michigan State because he's such a high, highly uh, visible in-state recruit. Michigan State hasn't really recruited in-state like to the extent that they did under under Mark D'Antonio. He's super visible, um, a high-level receiver. On the other hand, a receiver is a position where you can go out and get in a lot of different ways. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lose sleep over it, but you never like to see a guy that highly ranked in state um, you know, move on. I got you. Good good point. Paul Conardy, great work as always. Check out his story on McCulloch. Uh, visited this weekend, 2024 basketball recruit over at SpartanMag.com. Right now, go over there, become a subscriber, get access to that, get access to our March Madness coverage going on for the next however long, 
two, three weeks, whatever, four weeks possibly, and into spring practice and football recruiting into the spring and summer. SpartanMag.com is where you're going to want to go if you're a big Michigan State fan. Conan Dyke's work and everybody else over there at SpartanMag.com. Go check it out. Paul, appreciate your time. I'll check in with you in the next day or so. I really appreciate it, man. I took I, You're on the phone for a long time with me today. I really appreciate this. Uh, over an hour as a guest segment with us here at Spartan Mag Live. Thanks a lot, Paul. Get some sleep, and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Thank you. All right, take care. There goes Paul Konerdyke, associate editor, SpartanMag.com. A great one. Uh, great hard worker, great uh, writer, great reporter. We're lucky to have him at Spartan Mag for sure. All right. Um, question, Andy from Parts Unknown, back to the mailbag, says, this program feels like it's stuck in neutral or going in reverse. What do they have to do to change it? I assume he's talking about football, uh, neutral or in reverse, five and seven season. season. Um, what do they need to do to change it? To change it, blocking and tackling and accountability, quality control. What's quality control? Defensive backs on the same page, pass rushers in the proper lanes, Receivers running the right routes, all those things. Michigan State did a few things well last year, but man, it doesn't take much slippage at all to go five and seven or four and eight. The Big Ten is that good. It's not great, it's good. And if you're just a little bit off, you lose to Indiana, you lose to Maryland, and boom, you're five and seven. I'm not saying seven and five is great, but with that schedule, seven and five is acceptable as base camp while you're working on the rest of the outfit, the rest of the expedition, right? So what do they have to do to change it? The basics. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure that that's, you know, and then that's, and that can be done. That can be done with good, solid evaluation, player development, and three-star recruits. They're going after the big ones. Um, That's one way to do it. And it's been fun to watch Michigan State go after it. But they, they have to get those, um, those, those, the basics down. And Mel Tucker's a basics type of guy, and they're, they're going to be, they're going to be on it. Uh, we'll see if there's progress. Let's go over here to the comments area. What do we have? A couple long guests there, you know, on the eve of tournament time. I hope everybody appreciates a little bit of taking a look back memory lane, Michigan State basketball, and some great memories from the NCAA tournament. And what a, what a privilege, privilege it is for Michigan State fans to be part of a program that has such a rich history that we can go back 20 years of NCAA tournament participation and Final Four runs, Final Four runs, and Elite Eights against Connecticut and Louisville and UConn and, and all those things. It's really a, something that Michigan State fans should not take for granted, should not lose sight of. The amount of rich NCAA tournament history and stories in this program in the last 24 years is astounding. Astounding. And the Final Four is not on the schedule, right? But it could happen again this year. I'm not saying it will, but I wouldn't bet the farm against it. Now, they've got a lot of work to do. Got to get that defense squared away. They're not as physically strong. They got to be able to stay zeroed in. But I, I think they're going to be a really tough out. We'll see what happens this weekend. All right, uh, comments. Let me see where we left off. All right, Spartan MD comp, can you comment on the Nick Marsh decommitment? We already did that at the top of the show. You can go back and get that on demand a little bit later. This is from back when we were talking about the Middle Tennessee State game. Malcolm Jones Sr. says, I'm a fair daddy. If you do not work hard, I will not play him. I hear that as a father. All right, Mark Webster, Michigan State football needs some good spring ball news. Could use some excitement. I would agree with that. Fleet says, road to 10,000 subscribers. Appreciate your enthusiasm and support, Fleet. We're, we just hit the 7,000 mark tonight, I think, right? Do we hit 10,000 tonight? Um, something like that. Let me see. Wait, that, wait, close your ears. That's what we do for getting over another 1,000 plateau. Oh, also Nevada Sparty. Nevada Sparty coming through strong. What was that? Was that $45? Thank you, Nevada Sparty, uh, for being 
a generous personal sponsor of tonight's program at Spartan Mag in general. Thanks for supporting here at the Tip Jar. It's kind of like a bar. I, I, I picture you guys all, all, even though it's a work night, I know Big Don, he's, he's drinking some, some spirits, got some refreshments, cup of cheer. I respect that. I just feel like we're uh, up at the bar talking about Michigan State sports in some ways. I know we got the press box or field level. That's what the scenery is sometimes. I need to just get like a bar, a bar, a bar, inter- like a bar interior. Maybe I'll go down to Rick sometime and take an interior shot in there. Or if you're watching somewhere around East Lansing, you become a sponsor. We'll put your bar in the background here. Or we'll go do the show at your bar. We will do that. Or restaurant or car dealership. Anywhere in the state of Michigan. I'll go to the Big Buck Brewery in Gaylord. I don't care. We'll, we'll load it up on the road. We'll bring Conan Dyke up there. We'll have a good time. Anyway, um, kind of like the old. Remember some of you that live in the, the Detroit area or across um, United States, Canada, North America, Newfoundland. That was my foster Hewitt, if you know Hockey Night in Canada these days. Uh, the old CBC... Don Sherry used to have a show called The Grapevine, and it was just Don Sherry with another with a straight man who was dressed up as a bartender, bow tie, and Don Sherry was at a bar with a live studio audience, and they would have like a guest, like Bobby Orr or something like that. But the 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 set was a bar, had a bartender at a bar, and it was a cool show. That's kind of what I feel this is, even though it's not the right backdrop right now. But all of you, even on a work night. Some of you, maybe it's not a work night. Enjoying it, talking about sports, and I appreciate the support, support from Fleet saying on the road to 10,000 subscribers. Appreciate that. M. Nevada, M. Nevada says, who ends up being the starting quarterback by the end of the season for Michigan State next year? Leader in the clubhouse is Peyton Thorne, but it's a real competition, and that competition will carry over into the season. And if the season gets derailed a little bit, I could certainly see... Noah Kim or Kaden Hauser. Now they got to keep Kaden Hauser in it, you know. But Noah Noah Kim is pounding on that door. Noah Kim's pretty good. He could play somewhere. It's a tight situation there, and I don't have the answer. Good question. Marlon Milano says, "I think we're going to miss BT Jordan from a recruiting standpoint." You might re- might be right. Uh, BT Jordan, Brandon Jordan, Michigan State pass rush coach, announced this week that he's headed to Seattle, leaving Michigan State to go to uh, the NFL. And he's a big-time pass rush whisperer, which caught the attention of a lot of pass rush recruits around the country. Michigan State's gotten some good ones this year and was in on some good ones otherwise and is in on some good ones for next year, but now he's gone. No question that's going to hurt recruiting because he was a pull. So we'll see what they, uh, what they bring in to replace him. But he was a different... He was a one-of-a-kind, different type of guy. Not really a busy recruiter out there on the trail. He's more of a a destination type guy, people would recruit to him. Did he enjoy recruiting? I'm not sure. But he was in, as far as recruiting goes, he did have some ends with some guys like Jacoby Winman, a Louisiana native, as was BT Jordan, helped bring him in. But his expertise as a pass rush coach resonated with recruits and people that handle recruits. So that's not a, not it's not going to be around anymore. Uh, Mel Tucker was uh, outside the box, in hiring BT Jordan, BT Jordan had a little bit of re- of coaching experience somewhere. Was it McNeese State or something like that? Just a little bit, and then he put his own business together as a as a uh, pass rush coach. But it was an outside the box creative hire by Mel Tucker to bring him in. Does he go that route? Is there another guy out there like that? I'm not even sure, but uh, it was a dent. All right, Alex James says, I think one, maybe two Big Ten teams will reach the Sweet 16. Michigan is built for tournament play. Purdue will get outscored in Game 2. Michigan State has a chance, but hot shooting will be hard to keep up. I agree with all that. Uh, Doors Fan 91 says, hit the like. Thanks for that. appreciate that. And then here's Nevada Sparty right there. With his, it's $49. $49. I apologize. I sold him short a little bit. Thank you, Nevada Sparty, for that. And thank you to Don Strait earlier as well. Tim Hughes says, Michigan, very weak schedule, and we'll be lucky to even make the tourney. That is true also. They have to beat Rutgers, then they have to beat Purdue, then they'll get in. If they do, um, they could be pretty good. So if you're a Michigan State fan, you're a Michigan hater, uh, you want them to lose to Rutgers or Purdue because they can be like Jason. They just keep coming back. Uh, you need to kill them if you hate them, right? 
Alex James says, if they make it, they could go on a run. Would not be shocked if Michigan wins the Big Ten tourney. I would agree with that. They're playing pretty well. Mentioned that earlier. Enough about them. Uh, Alex James says, Nevada Sparty sent some casino money. Yes, he did. Thank you. Tim Hughes says, anyone could go on a run. Michigan State, Purdue, Iowa, Indiana, Northwestern. Big Ten tournament, Michigan beats Rutgers and gets beat by Purdue. Alex James says, yep, to beat Rutgers, you just need 60 points. Goalie31 says, what has the news been with Kerr Tang? Haven't been able to see too much with him. Yeah, that's been pretty quiet. You know, big time, top 50 um, forward out of, from the East Coast. We'll, we'll put our ear to the ground and try to get some updates on him. MSU Hunter says, come on, guys and gals, give Jim a like. Only 37 likes, 126 watching at that point. It's later at night now. Uh, we don't have as many watching now. Uh, still over 100, but 49 likes. We appreciate all of, all of those of you that are uh, supporting us in that way. Um, appreciate you guys rallying. Thanks, JJ McKay. Comp has earned them. Thanks a lot. Boat raced by Memphis. I remember I, I remember that loss to Minnesota. I believe it was tough. All right. Rocky Mountain Tom says, what's the feeling inside the football program? Are the recent coaching departures reason for concern? Um... You know, yeah, they didn't expect Coleman to leave. They didn't expect Jordan to leave. I mean, things like that happen. But it's, it's you know, Jordan, I, I I wrote this on the Underground Bunker message board the other day. If he had had success at Michigan State, eventually SEC schools were going to come after him, try to bring him back down south where he's from, and they were going to be offering a lot of money. Could Michigan State have matched it? Maybe so. But if you pay him that much, then you might have to pay everybody on your staff more, and then that money kind of can run thin. Um, I didn't think he would be here very long. I got a lot of respect for him, but I didn't think he'd be here very long. Coleman, I mean, that hurts. He goes back to Georgia Tech. They got him from Georgia Tech. He goes back to Georgia Tech. Now, now all of a sudden, you've got a lot of change over there in the defensive line. And it might not hurt this year, but um, they could be losing defensive linemen after this year. A lot of them are going to be graduating. So in 2024, with, you know, with the new defensive line coach coming in from Stanford, uh, that's that's going to be a challenge. That It's... Um, I'm not saying they can't build something there good for the long term and be very good on D-line over and over, and they'll, they'll try to do it in the portal. The guys they're bringing in from the portal this year, the guy from Liberty, defensive tackle, DeAndre Butler, I think is his name, and uh, Tunisi Adelaide coming in from A&M, Jared Jackson coming in from Florida State. I watched the Florida State. I watched Jared Jackson. You know, he's a guy. He's not a dude. He's a guy. He's all right. I don't think he's a difference maker. I don't think the guy from Liberty is a difference maker. Tunisi is ranked high. Um... You know, was a five-star recruit, redshirted one year at AM, and and then last year played two games and then was lost of the season to an injury. I watched their game. Was it against Sam Houston State or something? He's a young player. You know, it's hard to tell too much from someone playing their first college game. They need him to be something, but we'll see. Tim Hughes says, tough schedule, campus tragedy, how this team is responding. I think they make an NCAA run. Sweet 16 or Elite 8. I don't disagree. J.J. McKay says, I think Michigan State would have taken it all in 2020. I don't disagree. So, I mean, if, if anytime someone out there is saying, you know, Izzo never won a national title, like that's a strike against him, he's had circumstances. I mean, Dean Smith did not win his first national title until his 20th year. And he had some other years where they he had some injuries in the NCAA tournament. But if you've watched Izzo's career closely... They've been, they've been, they've been close, and he's due some good luck. He's due some breaks, and I do think he will win a national, another national title at some point. Spartan AG ninety nine says we are going to stay hot from three and lock down on defense and make another run. Go green. Alex James says that team was sharing. I'm not going to repeat that. Um, Jake says, how about Michigan State hockey? Think we can take Minnesota? Best of one. Go green. Minnesota looks really good. You have to hope that Minnesota, with the week off, there's some rust. And in a one-game situation, they've only got 60 minutes to prove they're the better team. And Minnesota is the better team. But in this sport, this is the sport of Miracle on Ice. So, doubtful. Harder to do it up there also with that wide Olympic ice. Very good Minnesota team. I love watching them play. It's going to be hard for Michigan State. If they win, um, it'll be the biggest win for Michigan State hockey since the 2007 National Championship game. It gets them into the tournament. It'll be their first. It'll be, what, their second tournament since 07? But that would be um, amazing if that happens. And if they beat Minnesota one week later, solid chance Big Ten Tournament Championship game will be in Ann Arbor against the Wolverines. 
Would that be fun? Is hockey fun again? Yes, it is. In East Lansing. Spartan AG99 says, MSU hockey getting the win over Notre Dame was awesome. Fun games to watch. Go green. AG999 says, Izzo probably sees these guys shooting the lights out in practice and knows they can sustain this heat. Yes, but he's trying to get the defense together. It was a great practice today. It was fun to watch. Izzo was in Hall of Fame form. Demanding. Demanding of his coaches. High decibels. But a lot of compliments being dished out also. Getting them fluffed up. It's good. LFG says, early college football call just based on breaks, luck, college football fate. I predict 2023 Michigan State will squeak by Washington in East Lansing. 2023 Washington lost three great offensive linemen and their secondary remains iffy in 23. So LFG calling it right now. Michigan State over the Huskies at Spartan Stadium in September. 23 Washington College Football lost their all-universe field goal kicker and their star running back from 22. I will trust 23 Michigan State offensive line will have improved run blocking in Tucker's boring offense. And I am a big Thorn or Kim fan. LFG all over the map. Glad MSU hockey knocked off Notre Dame. Go green. I mashed. Thanks for that thumbs up. Mash that thumbs up button. Hit that thumbs up button. That like button. Smash it. <laughs> right? Don Cherry, it's Hockey Night in Canada. LFG, comp sports history knowledge is amazing. I wouldn't go that far. Uh, I got some decent knowledge from 70s, 80s, into the 90s. Last 15 years, I get some stuff mixed up, I got to tell you. Trevor Thompson says, was watching the beginning of the show. Hogard was 13 by media and honorable mention by the coaches, not just honorable mention. Thanks. Uh, we wrote that story earlier and only had the, the um, coaches voting at that point. So it's 13 by media. I need to update that story. Thank you for that, Trevor. LFG says, I understood Coleman going home. I'm happy for Brandon, too, presuming Tuck knew ahead of time. It's my understanding he he didn't know about the Brandon thing. I mean, he found out right around the time that it was offered to him, but I, it's my understanding it took everyone by surprise a little bit. Connor Buscini says, are you doing any call-ins tonight? Just joining in. Thanks, Connor, for joining, but we're about done. We've been going for, you know, a couple, what, three hours, so no call-ins tonight. Uh, come back on Sunday, probably going to have something after the brackets come out. Now, when the bracket comes out, Michigan State gets an opponent. Really good chance I'm not going to know a lot about the opponent. And we'll do about an hour here and uh, see what we know about it. I'll, probably, I'll try to cram some film real quick. And um, I don't know if we'll have something or not, but... In the last couple of years, people have enjoyed that. That you know, after the bracket show, and people are all fidgety, and then Michigan State fans, I think, might get a kick out of that. I will have a lot of work to do that night as well, so maybe. So uh, keep that keep that marked, keep that date on your calendar, if you would, please. That's something Gene Okerlund used to say. All right, we got um, James Douglas Morrison from Southwestern Michigan. I know who you are, and you're probably still watching right now. He says, comment, not a question. He says, difficult schedule on paper for 2023. Offensively, Michigan State looks average at best when it comes to Big Ten playmakers. Michigan State's NIL and recruiting prowess seems a bit exaggerating, in my opinion, says James Douglas Morrison from Southwest Michigan. He goes on to say, long way to go, but starting to feel like Coach Mel Tucker's program is a house of cards and can implode if they don't have a great season, and at this point, I am not optimistic unless some young guys emerge on offense and defense make huge improvements. That's not a question. That's a comment from James Douglas Morrison from Southwest Michigan. Uh, post number six from the Underground Bunker message board, WX Spartan from Parts Unknown says, are you buying, holding, or selling Tucker stock at this point? I still believe in Tucker, but we cannot catch a break right now. Um the stock analogy, something a lot of people use in sports and other things in general. I mentioned that he was a buy in June of 2021 when I, um, for a number of reasons. I was very impressed with a lot of things he was doing that offseason. When I saw it with my own eyes, a couple of things on the recruiting trail and other things. Long term. Then they went out and had K-9 and had a great season. And if you would have bought right then, you'd had a lot of gains. And then last season, I'd say, well, sell half of your earnings and hold on to some. I'm still hold. Um, I think Tucker has a high ceiling. The way I'd describe it, I mean, Tuck, uh, Mark D'Antonio had the program 
operating at a 99% clip of its potential against Alabama when Connor Cook was down inside the 10-yard line late in the first half, trailing 10-0. At that point, if you throw a touchdown pass and you go in halftime down 10-7 to Alabama in the college football playoff, I'm not saying Michigan State would have won. They would not have won. But that would be like hitting, boom, you're at 100. You're, you're, you, at that point with Mark D'Antonio, you, would, you will have hit the highest that the Michigan State program, you would have, you're at the ceiling. You're at max productivity. And that's a great compliment to Mark D'Antonio or anyone that could get max productivity out of anything. If, if Connor Cook reads that it's cover two and doesn't throw that fade against it, and they get something else elsewhere, 100%. Um, college football playoff was about the max. Two years earlier in 2013, was it Florida State won the national title that year? They beat Auburn or the other way around. The next summer at Big Ten Media Days, D'Antonio said, I think, he said, I think we had the best team in the country. I think we could have beaten them. I think we, we could have won a national championship that year. Um, Maybe. Michigan State beat a very good Stanford team in the Rose Bowl that year. Florida State and Auburn were good, but Florida State was just starting to come down a little bit. Auburn was in the national championship game for one reason and one reason only. Because they were ranked higher in the preseason than Michigan State was. Michigan State was unranked. And there was no playoff that year. Auburn was higher. They both had a good season. They both lost one game. And... Auburn goes to the national championship game based on preseason notoriety and reputation at the time. If the preseason reputation had been a little bit different, Michigan State could have been there against Florida State. Could they have beaten them? Maybe. It was a very good Michigan State team. So they were Michigan. He had Michigan State hitting the ceiling of potential. As good as they were, Tucker comes in and says he wants to recruit at a national championship clip. It's not necessarily what D'Antonio did. D'Antonio wanted to model it like Iowa and Wisconsin and be good and tough and correct every single year and pulled it off. And that meant getting a program that's 8-4, 9-3, 10-2, maybe get a couple breaks, maybe run into a Le'Veon Bell and a Trey Waynes and a Darquise Denard and, and boom, maybe go 11-1. and one. Aiming for 9-2 and two and you end up 11-1. and one. Not trying to overstep your bounds, and it was a, it was a great way to do it. And they were hitting their head on the ceiling. They were great. Tucker comes in, and he wants to go beyond that. He wants to go. He wants to put together a roster, as you know, like what he had at Alabama and Georgia as an assistant coach. And the only way to do that is to recruit like heck with great effort and great personalities, and just being aggressive and going after those four and five star recruits in the South because that's where most of them are. Guys that D'Antonio and Michigan State didn't really go after a whole lot because back in that era, if you wanted players like that, you had to buy them. You had to cheat to get those guys. Michigan State didn't do, didn't, didn't go down there and recruit a whole lot. Didn't try. Things are different now. Name, image, and likeness. Timing of that was good for the way Tucker wanted to recruit. They came in 100% effort, a different type of effort, and it was unique to watch. You know that that first when they were first on the job during COVID, they were hitting it hard, hitting it hard, and getting a lot of interest those were the zoom babies they recruited that class off of zoom didn't see them in person just off of film and zoom meetings and that class might not turn out to be so great it's okay next year better the next year better so you gotta let them get some recruiting classes in because he was going to do it differently now have they discarded too many players to, to bring in guys from the portal that's one way they've done it and frankly from the portal kenneth walker was great but they've had a lot of just kind of non-traction guys out of the portal. And if you do a lot of that, can you still have great togetherness? I've been impressed that is it the amount of turnover they've had in the roster, guys coming in with a bunch of guys from the portal, not many people on the roster that have been in the program for four years, but the togetherness seems to be pretty good. Last year they go five and seven, and I didn't see guys dragging. Maybe there was some internal stuff, I don't know. But I didn't see anything. I've been impressed how they've been able to hold it together for the most part. So as good as D'Antonio was and as high as he got them and even on the cusp of national championship contention, bringing in Tucker and going for that, those four and a half stars, those occasional five stars and his personality, 
I thought the ceiling was higher. I'm not saying he was going to get there, but the ceiling was here for D'Antonio, and he hit it. He was great. I'm not saying Tucker's going to get there, but I thought the ceiling became higher with Tucker. That being said, the floor is also lower. It's an analogy a lot of people use these days for a lot of things. I think it applies to this also. So um, Tucker's going to keep going relentless, full speed, going after the type of roster he wants to put together. And today's decommitment hurts, but they're going to keep working at it. They need more wins, more winning seasons. It feeds off each other. They recruited really well last year um, in the summer after that 11-2 and two season. If they'd had a good season again this fall, you know, Michigan State ended up with the number 24 recruiting class and on three industry rankings with a 5-7 and seven record. If Michigan State had had another 10-2 and two regular season, I think Michigan State would have had a top 15 class. So there's potential. Now that doesn't guarantee you know, those players are going to um, play like top 15 recruits four years later, but that's how you get there from here. So it's interesting to watch, and Michigan State's planning their work, working their plan, and you let them keep going at it. Question number seven, Tampa Spartan says, do you think that Mel Tucker's coaching the DBs takes away from, at all from his overall head coaching responsibilities and abilities? Um, I don't know. I thought last year was interesting with when he coached the corners. He's a defensive backs coach by trade. He coached corners for Saban. Coached DBs in the NFL. So I thought that was an interesting move for Tucker when Travaris Tillman left, it's kind of brushed out. When uh, Tucker had that 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 um, opening on his staff, he didn't go out and hire a corners coach. He went out and brought in Brandon Jordan as a pass rush specialist and said, "You know what? I'm coaching the corners." That was a bold move. That was a baller move. And pass rush looked good those first two games. Then it kind of evened out. I'm not saying he had the greatest talent to work with, but kind of inconclusive. Cornerback play was not great last year, so he's got to get guys in there and spend more time with them and see if he can develop guys as they go. Amir's speed was not good. It was not a good evaluation, and he was he struggled. I mean, the coaches knew. I mean, they didn't, he wasn't starting in game 11. They saw it. So there were some injuries there also. Ronald Williams did not take a next step. I thought he was functional. In, 2012, in 2021, and then this year in 2022 didn't start. I don't know what went on there. You know, a lot of times there's things going on and we don't hear what the situation is. It looked to me like he was healthy. I don't know. But cornerback play needs to get back on it. Chuck Brantley still playing well. Dylan Tatum came in and played well at corner. I tell you what, Mel Tucker did a good job with him because Dylan Tatum, his high school film, I got a lot of respect for him as a young man, as a student athlete, as a competitor, good one. He was very good in high school with the ball in his hands on offense. On defense, at the safety position, he played safety without making contact. I watched it closely, and he was not a guy that was a heat-seeking missile. He ran around well, but he just really didn't know how to play. But he's a good guy, good heart, a good team-oriented guy. Played some safety, then there were some injuries. He moved to corner and survived. He was functional. He's got quick feet. He's got a thick build, so maybe he's a safety long-term. I'm not sure. But those quick feet, maybe he stays at safe. Maybe he stays at corner. Maybe he can be a physical guy with that thick build and the quick feet, learning more as he goes. When he was starting at corner, I was like, oh, man, I don't know about this. But he never got he never got burned out there, and he played four quarters against Penn State. And not necessarily his natural position coming in. Hadn't played a lot of DB in his life. He'd always been a ball-in-the-hand guy, offensive guy. Wanted to play DB his senior year in high school. Had a long way to go. He was better than I thought. And that's a four-star guy that was ranked high. And that was one guy where I'm like, man, don't expect too much from him. He's got a lot to learn. Well, he learned it quickly. Credit to Dylan Tatum. Credit to Mel Tucker. Did a good job with him. Got some others that are coming in. Ade Willie and some others that are just that they're just starting to work with. So we'll see what goes on with the spring with them. Still remains to be seen how that all works out. And with BT Jordan gone, what he does in terms of hiring assistant coaches. Does he bring in another defensive line coach to put two up front and he stay coaching the corners? Or does he bring a corner coach in and uh, leave it that way? I don't know, but it'll be interesting to see. I'm not sure. Sparty from Pauley's Island, South Carolina says, Hey, Jim, do you think Tucker and his staff were blindsided by the loss of Jordan? Or do you think the writing was on the wall with him? I just mentioned that a minute ago. That's a good question. Um, as far as I could tell, they were surprised, but I'm not surprised. They were surprised when it happened. I don't think they were surprised that people were coming after him. You know, that there were other 
schools that came after him. I'm not sure anyone came after him with a huge blank check type of situation, but that was only a matter of time for that to happen if he had the type of success at Michigan State that they brought him here to have. Uh, Sparty says from Pauley's Island, South Carolina, says, did the hiring of Deron Reynolds from Stanford have any negative influence on Jordan's decision to leave? Not that I, not that I know of. Um, Brandon Jordan is a very agreeable personality. He wasn't going to get his you know, feathers ruffled by a, a, a new coach coming in. Spartan6674 says, Steelhead on, Jim. Better get ready. Talking about the Steelhead. Um, sounds like, okay, it's March. Steelhead, they're running you know, at the Pier Marquette River up north, which is... Got my Michigan map here. It's like right, right there. Pier Marquette. Tell you what, the Steelhead run in Lake Erie a little bit too. Steel, steelhead is basically a rainbow trout with a chrome look. But I think DNA-wise, it's a rainbow trout. But um, fight like hell, pound for pound. The toughest fish in the Great Lakes, probably pound for pound. Would you agree with that? Let me know, those of you that are out there. All right, SD401 says, who are some players you are keeping an ear to the ground for during spring practice, i.e. guys that you think have potential to break out and may start to show signs this spring? That's a good question. I'm going to table that to the next Spartan Mag Live. That's a good one. We've already gone for three hours. That's, that's a long one. Spartan Roxy says, are there players who signed with Michigan State and are now in class that may feel they got gypped because B.T. Jordan left? Yes, probably, and that's the nature of college sports. I mean, by Job came here to work with Brandon Jordan, among other things. Andrew DePape, probably similar. So, feeling gypped. I don't know, that's the business. You know, Xavier Henderson felt that way when Harlan Barnett left. And then three years later, Harlan Barnett's back. So you never know. That's it for tonight. SD41, I'm going to move this question to the top. And the very next Spartan Mag Live, which could be on Sunday, although Sunday's probably going to be all basketball, I will revisit that question. Thank you for posting that. Let's go back over here to the comments before we sign off. Um, okay, Connor Bugini says, I'll tune in. Any predictions for the Big Ten tournament? And will you be there? Conan Dyke's going to be there. I will not be there. I'll be sitting back here watching some things and getting ready for a busy night on Selection Sunday because I usually cram video and try to have a preview and matchup preview on Monday morning. That's what I traditionally do for Big Ten Tournament. Um, I'll be supporting him from back here. He'll be doing the, the coverage from the, uh, from the front lines. Michigan State plays on Friday. It's in the noon hour. Um, we'll probably do a... Vcast this way like we did last year so tune in for that anyway hey everybody thanks for joining us don Strait and nevada sparty thank you for your uh generous donations in the tip jar thanks for those of you staying with us for this long still near 100 three hours later thanks for those of you that are not watching live go over to spartanmag.com become a magger we want you over there we want you to be a subscriber and we and we appreciate your support the more support we get the better we can do as a news, news organization in terms of um funding and so forth so thanks a lot thanks to everybody for coming out again on a tuesday night in east lansing and hope everybody's doing well we'll see you next time for spartan mag live my name is jim Camperoni. you can watch at spartan mag live we'll see you at spartanmag.com